Good morning and welcome to Justi the Justice Committee's eighth meeting of 2018. There are no apologies. Agenda item one is the decision on taking business in private, which is consideration of our forward work programme. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Agenda item number two is continuation of consideration of the Civil Litigation Expenses Group Proceedings Scotland Bill at Stage 2. And I refer members to their copy of the bill and the marshaled list of amendments and groupings for this item. And I welcome back to the committee Annabel Ewing, Minister of Community Safety and Legal Affairs, and her official. And we will now move to consideration of the amendment, starting with Group 10, Pursuers Liability for Court Fees in Personal Injury Claims, call Amendment Number 11 in the name of Daniel Johnson, grouped with Amendments 64 and 16. Daniel Johnson to move Amendment 11 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the, the purpose of this amendment is to uh, look at uh, the pay-as-you-go model for court fees. Now, this is an issue that has been raised by trade unions and other bodies uh, as being a not insignificant hurdle toward that, uh, 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 in terms of bringing forward uh, court actions. Uh, and therefore, what my amendment uh, seeks to do is to, uh, <coughs> rather than having those fees being paid on an ongoing basis through court action, have them paid at the end, where uh, obviously if there's a successful action, um, that is a lot easier to, uh, to, to settle once uh, uh, damages have been awarded. Um, I'd also just like to point out that I think that in, in broad terms, it's very much in line with um, the amendment that, that, that John Finney has, has uh, uh, tabled as well, although I think his amendment goes, goes further than mine. But I think at this stage, um, I would be uh, urging members to support both of these amendments um, um, th there have been some comments made uh, contrary to these, uh, uh, in particular uh, from the Scottish Court Service, who argue that the, <coughs> the pay-as-you-go model encur um, encourages early settlement and that debt recovery would carry a cost. However, I would point out that I, think that I don't think the pay-as-you-go uh, encouraging early settlement is a particularly strong argument. Um, in particular, I think that what we are trying to do or what is being sought um, through uh, this bill as a whole is about uh, lowering the barriers uh, for individuals bringing forward uh, court cases. And I think that this proposal is very much in line with that. And likewise, I would just point out that the very nature of court action being that people are bringing these forward uh, via uh, solicitors. And I think that that, that uh, very fact that there would be an intermediary means that I think people are on, un, un, uh, well, a, it, it would uh, simplify the recovery of these debts as the courts would be pursuing um, solicitors' firms. And likewise, solicitors' firms will obviously be very mindful about the, the people's ability to pay uh, court fees as, as they go. Indeed, I think just because you're paying at the end of a, a, a service that you are under, uh, undertaking or procuring doesn't mean that you stop uh, looking at whether or not you can afford it, whether you're uh, this is court action that you're taking out or you're having work done to your, your house, you are always ha have, having to be mindful of uh, the bill that you are likely to face at the end of it. And simply paying at the end, I don't think necessarily um, makes a significant impact uh, on that. So um, just to, to, to recap, the primary reason for this is to, to, to lower the barriers uh, for people bringing forward court actions. And as I said, that this is something that has been brought forward by a number of people, including trade unions, as something that they would seek uh, to, to aid their, their work. Okay, can I move the amendment? Oh, and I'd move the, the amendment in my, in my name. Thank you. John Finney to speak to Amendment 64 and other amendments in the group. Um, thank you, Convener. I, I would align myself with everything that Daniel said. and. Um, it is a concern of, of trade unions, uh, this. Um, I think there are a, a few points to make, and, and, and that is the suggestion of debt recovery, I think, is, is a, a way bit off the mark. The, the nature of engagement in the process that takes place there, um, I, I think that means that that's extremely uh, um, unlikely to be an issue. Uh, and indeed, I um, imagine it would be said that uh, the parties involved had not acted in good faith if that was, and uh, would have had wider implications. So I think it's... Uh, it potentially is a barrier. Now, um, I, I, as things stand at the moment, um, I initially had an, a, an amendment uh, very similar to, to Daniel's, and I'm told that this amendment uh, that I have, Amendment 64, uh, which I move, um, is um, what's required to uh, completely bot bottom out the issue. So um, I'm 
support Daniels and I would encourage people to support my amendment. Thank you. Any other members have any comments? If not, we'll move to the Minister. Peter, good morning. Um, the main intention of Amendment uh, 11 appears to be to make court fees payable at the end of the case rather than under the present system as an action proceeds through the courts. Amendment 11 only applies to personal injury proceedings and in practice personal injury claimants usually do not pay upfront fees because they are benefiting from a success fee agreement. Part 1, one of the bill indeed encourages that practice and makes it more likely still that personal injury claimants will not be paying any upfront fees at all, including, therefore, court fees. Thus, uh, it could be argued that the real beneficiaries of Amendment 11 could well be law firms and claims management companies. A recent consultation on court fees has just recently closed, and the government's response to the consultation was published last week, together with impact assessments. Uh, and I'm sure that members may find it of interest because it sets out how the government proposes to protect access to justice whilst retaining the current pay-as-you-go model of court fees uh, in, in general terms. And I have just signed new fees instruments for the period from April 2018 to March 2021, and these have now been laid for scrutiny by this committee and by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. The Scottish Government supports the current pay-as-you-go model as it uh, promotes encouraging people to resolve their disputes outside the courts, it encourages settlement, it ensures that people value the resources of the court and use those resources wisely, it reinforces the level of financial risk if a party loses a case and it discourages unreasonable behaviour and deters weak or vexatious claims. Using a pay-as-you-go model actively supports those outcomes specifically because fees are charged in small increments as cases progress through each of the key steps in the legal process. And the effect is, indeed, to make the parties stop and consider whether it is appropriate for them to continue. Ultimately, under either a pay-as-you-go model or a bill at the end of the case model, the losing party will normally pay the fees of both parties. The winners the winner will be reimbursed or not billed, whilst the different models affect the timing. Therefore, they do not change that eventual outcome. Uh, I think it is worth pointing out again that under the proposals in the Bill for Success Fee Agreements and Personal Injury Actions in Section 6, it is indeed the solicitor rather than the client who will be liable for all outlays incurred in the provision of the relevant services to the client, including of course, court fees. The client will therefore not pay for court fees in such cases, which are amongst the most commonly litigated uh, in, in Scotland. Uh, and there is no barrier, therefore, under the bill to access to justice for personal injury actions, as the individual pursuer will not pay fees up front. Uh, moreover, the solicitor, for his or her part, will recover the court fees as part of the expenses recovered from the opponent at the conclusion of the case, assuming it is successful. Under the provisions of the bill on quarks, uh, the client cannot become liable uh, for their opponent's court fees even if they lose their case. It is worth pointing out that there are generous exemptions to the requirement for parties to pay court fees and this means that many vulnerable and disadvantaged groups of people will not pay court fees. The consultation analysis I have referred to just a moment ago confirms that the Scottish Government will be extending the exemptions regime to include uh, recipients of Scottish welfare funds, uh, people, often women, seeking civil protective orders as was suggested by Scottish Women's Aid. And in addition, the relevant income threshold will be increased below which fees are not to be paid. It is also worth noting that, uh, and I'm sure members are aware of our recent Supreme Court judgment concerning um, fees uh, in employment tribunals, uh, where the court found, uh, uh, while striking down the, the fees, that they were exorbitant uh, and acted as a barrier to justice. But the court... Uh, the Supreme Court did go on to say, and I think it's worth quoting, fees paid by litigants can, in principle, reasonably be considered to be a justifiable way of making resources available for the justice system and so securing access to justice. It must also be stressed, convener, that billing for court fees at the end of the case will place an immense burden on the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. The long-standing arrangements for the payment of court fees on the pay-as-you-go principle would have to be completely revised and reformed with consequent expense and disruption to business. Furthermore, the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service will have to attempt on behalf of the taxpayer to seek to recover court fees due, and inevitably there will be a measure of loss through irrecoverable debt. Uh, if court fees are not on a pay-as-you-go basis, this simply means that somebody else, the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, and indeed, therefore, the Scottish taxpayer, will have to pay them, and the debt uh, may never be recovered in all cases. 
There will therefore be a high cost to the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, the taxpayer and the efficient conduct of business in Scotland's courts in terms of disruption if the long-standing arrangements and court fees are fundamentally altered to make court fees payable at the end of cases rather than on an ongoing basis. And I think, certainly, yeah. I appreciate the, the clarification the Minister has given. In relation to this um, clawback um, provision, I think you've already suggested that um, the fees would be payable at each stage by the solicitor who then in turn recover them from, from the, uh, the litigant. Um, it seems to me unlikely that there would be um, a considerable difficulty in clawing back from solicitors' firms the fees due to the court. So in a sense that the problem would seem to be for solicitors recovering it rather than the courts and tribunal service. Is that not a fair reflection of, of, of where the, the actual problem in relation to chasing down debt may lie? Well, I, I think it, perhaps turning it slightly on, uh, on its head, looking at it from the perspective of, I think, what is motivating these amendments, which is concerns about access to justice, and I think we all share those. So uh, on that basis, if we take the personal injury actions, the most likely scenario is that they will be uh, part of a, a success fee arrangement, okay? And therefore, in such circumstances, it is, as Liam MacArthur points out, in those circumstances, the solicitor uh, uh, that takes the... Uh, the hit in the sense of taking on the obligation to pay upfront fees, including uh, therefore court fees. So in terms of the barriers uh, to justice that there have been concerns about, it is difficult therefore to see how that will uh, impede a pursuer from pursuing uh, a personal injury action. In terms of the, the, the member's point about recovery, uh, it, it is the case though that court fees are paid currently on a pay-as-you-go basis, and that is helping to resource uh, the work of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, as they have indicated in their letter to the committee, take away that ongoing resource and you have already a problem. And then, of course, at the end of the day, seeking to recover uh, is always easy on paper, but it may not in every single case prove practicable for whatever reason. And as I say, the key thing is that this is a pay-as-you-go system whereby this money is going into the court service and tribunal service. You take that away, you're taking away a big... Uh, part of the, the budget of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service and indeed those points are made in the uh, relevant documentation uh, concerning the, um, the uh, fees instruments recently laid with the committee which uh, will be considered I would imagine quite shortly by the committee where uh, they look at the potential negative impact in terms of shortfall on the operation of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service running into uh, I think some 30 odd million pounds over the piece so it is it is not a budget item that is insignificant. I do understand the motivation for these amendments, but I think that if we bear in mind that actually in the personal injury actions which these amendments are intended to cover, it is these cases indeed that will in most likely circumstances benefit from a success fee agreement and therefore it is the solicitor as part of their uh, package, if you like, that will be taking on the onus of paying all fees, uh, including court fees. And if I could add that in terms of budgetary implications, of course, if there is a gap in the budget for the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, they will come, of course, looking to central government to fill that gap. And I would just point out that uh, in terms of current financial budgetary constraints, uh, if they're looking for some money from the justice portfolio to uh, fill that gap that will be created, I, I can say that something, therefore, would have to give in the justice budget to pay that because there's not an infinite uh, amount of money uh, available. Um, I know that members have referred to the uh, letter that the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service sent uh, and the points that they made <coughs> in terms of the impact that they say as the ones operating the system such a move would have and also the, the fear of the, the perhaps unintended uh, consequences of the amendments uh, being put forward uh, this morning. Um, in terms of a, a more procedural aspect, they did also recommend the use of secondary legislation for the management of fees to retain the current flexibility and accessibility to a wider uh, audience. Uh, and uh, for those reasons, I would uh, respectfully ask uh, Daniel Johnson to withdraw Amendment 11 and not to move Amendment 16. As far as John Finney's Amendment 64 is concerned, this would mean that if a pursuer had the benefit of Cox, they would not be liable for court fees at all. I consider this amendment to be unnecessary if a pursuer has the benefit of Cox. They are only liable to pay the success fee at the end of the case, but only if they win. All other expenses, including court fees, are, as I said, the responsibility of the solicitor uh, uh, to pay out up front and not the uh, pursuer. 
it is not clear to me uh, why a substantial benefit should be provided to those uh, providers of the service when that benefit will come with, as I say, a substantial cost to the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service and ultimately the taxpayer. Uh, in addition, as I say, any exemptions to civil court fees are best made in the body of court fees orders since this is the existing enabling power in section 107 of the Courts Reform Scotland Act uh, 2014. Um, and the new fee instruments, which I have mentioned, have exempt, exemptions within them, including, as I have uh, set out, new additional exemptions that will be particularly relevant to women seeking civil protective orders for domestic abuse. So I would also uh, consider Amendment 64, uh, perhaps well-intentioned as it is, nonetheless, for the reasons I have given at some length, but I felt that that was important to do so, convener, uh, to be unnecessary and indeed potentially harmful to the funding of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service and I would ask uh, Mr Finney to consider not moving that amendment as well. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Daniel Johnson to wind up. Press or withdraw? Um, uh, I mean, I think the, 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 the arguments are, are, are relatively straightforward and are just in terms of the Minister's response, I, I mean, I think there is a, a slight contradiction uh, in terms of her stating that the benefit would be primarily for law firms uh, and then uh, dismissing uh, the point that, that, that they would be the ones uh, liable for this, this and, and the ones re requiring to recover their, their fees. I think this is a significant barrier in terms of just simple cash flow, um, particularly for trade unions, and for those reasons um, I will press uh, the amendment. The question is Amendment 11 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will be a division. All those in favour of Amendment 11, please show. All those against? We have two for and nine against. The amendment is not agreed. Call Amendment 64 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 11. 11. John Finney to move or not move? Okay, not move, Commissioner. Not moved. Um, we now move to Group 11, free representation. Call Amendment 37 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendment 38 and 39. Minister to move Amendment 37 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Chair Principal Taylor recommended in his report that in the interest of transparency, uh, and I'm quoting, in the interest of transparency, the arrangements as to how a litigation is to be funded must be disclosed to the court and intimated to all parties at the stage when proceedings are raised or notification given that a cause is to be defended. This applies equally to cases where legal representation is provided on a pro bono basis. Uh, Amendment 37 therefore makes this clear in the bill. The rationale for disclosure of funding arrangements is that this may facilitate earlier settlement of a case. Amendment 37 will require a party to disclose to the court that part or all of its legal representation has been provided free of charge. Section 10 already uh, requires third party funding to be disclosed and the new provision here will complement this. Section 9 of the bill permits a payment to be made to a charity where a party is successful in litigation and has been represented free of charge, in other words, on a pro bono basis. There is indeed a long and honourable tradition of pro bono representation in Scotland. The payment to charity would be in place of expenses being paid to the successful party. Chair Principal Taylor thought, indeed, that it would be inappropriate to compensate a party for a liability in expenses, expenses which they have not actually incurred. Amendment 38 makes it clear that the size of the payment to charity should be decided by the court on the same basis as it would have done if the representation had not been free of charge. And this broadly follows the model of Section 194 of the Legal Services Act 2007 for England and Wales. Amendment 39 disapplies the provisions of Section 9, Subsection 2, where a party is provided with financial assistance by the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Representation funded by the Commission still has to be disclosed, as is the case for all funding arrangements. In its written evidence to the Committee, the Equality and Human Rights Commission queried how Section 9 of the Bill was to interact with Section 28 of the Equality Act 2006. That latter section empowers the Commission to provide assistance in civil proceedings concerning equality law. The Equality and Human Rights Commission was concerned that under Section 9 of the Bill as currently drafted, it might not get the expenses to which it would otherwise be entitled under Section 29 of the 2006 Equality Act. <coughs> Amendment 39 therefore rectifies this situation and the EHRC will still be able to claim expenses in such cases. My officials have checked convener and there do not appear to be any similar special expenses resumes for other public bodies. 
Uh, for example, the Scottish Human Rights Commission is not empowered to fund civil proceedings by third parties. I move Amendment 37. Okay. Any comments from members? It does seem to prove the uh, uh, transparency, min, uh, Minister. Uh, Minister, to wind up, no, not necessary. The question is there for Amendment 37 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Call amendments 38, 39 and 40 on the name of the Minister, all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move amendments 38 to 40 on block. Uh, moved on block. Does anyone object to a single question being put on amendments 38 to 40? No. Um, the question is therefore that amendments 38 to 40 are agreed. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are all agreed. Um, the question is that section 9 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Move now to group 12, third party funding. Call amendment 41 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments 42, 43, 44, 61, 45, 46 and 12. Minister to move amendment 41 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Chair Principal Taylor recommended both in his report and in his evidence to this committee that all funding in civil litigation should be disclosed to the court. The rationale for this is that disclosure has implications for how parties proceed, their willingness to settle and to settle early. Chair Principal Taylor said that, and I quote, disclosure expedites dispute resolution to the benefit of both parties and promotes efficiency in the legal system. Section 10 has been reworked, therefore, to cover all disclosure of all funding of litigation. In the bill as originally introduced, Section 10 only provided for transparency in the case of third party funders who have a financial interest in the outcome of a case. Amendment 41 adjusts subsection uh, 1 so that Section 10 now applies a duty of disclosure to all funding of litigation in Scottish courts. Sometimes, for example, if a pursuer is crowdfunded by people with pseudonyms or who remain anonymous, he or she will not know the identity of all the funders. Amendment 42, therefore, provides for this possibility and makes an exception to the rule that the names of all funders must be disclosed to the effect that this is only if they are known to the litigant. Amendment 44 now makes separate provision for the narrower cases where the funder has a financial interest in the proceedings, in other words, commercial funding. Subsection 2A includes the text that was formerly in subsections 2C and subsection 3, which is removed by Amendment 43. It allows the court to make uh, awards of expenses against venture capitalists, commercial funders, if a case is lost. At stage one, there was some concern that solicitors and other providers of success fee agreements would also be pursued for expenses by successful defenders. Albeit that, of course, such defenders would not be able to claim expenses from the litigant in personal injury cases because of the effect of qualified one-way cost shifting in Section 8. A new subsection 2B therefore makes it clear that the provision of Section 10 on liability to expenses will not apply to providers of success fee agreements. Amendment 61, lodged by John Finney, makes it clear that a trade union or similar body representing the interests of workers will also not be liable for any expenses if the pursuer, whom they have supported, is unsuccessful in court. <coughs> Amendment 12, in the name of Daniel Johnson, is similar, but firstly restricts the exemption to trade unions only, and secondly also exempts funding from trade unions from the general disclosure requirement. That would, however, depart from Chair Principal Taylor's recommendations about <coughs> transparency. I have noted in relation to the application of Section 10 to trade unions and similar bodies raised at Stage 1, uh, the, uh, sorry, I have noted the concerns in relation to that, and I'm happy, therefore, to support John Finney's Amendment Number 61. But I'm afraid not that of Daniel Johnson, as I, I feel um, that whilst it was likely that Mr Johnson, Johnson was indeed seeking to achieve the same results as Mr Finney's amendment, I think Mr Finney's amendment better reflects uh, the overarching um, principles of the bill. Finally, Convener, in its written evidence to the Justice Committee, the Family Law Association expressed concerns about Section 10 in some situations. First, this might be where a pursuer, and in particular a pursuer who has been dependent on their spouse or partner for support throughout the course of their relationship, uh, requires a litigation loan to raise proceedings against that spouse or partner. Second, parents may give a loan to a child to fund a deposit on a pre-marriage property, and it then becomes part of the dispute in the context of subsequent divorce proceedings. The association's view was that it is not helpful or appropriate to require parties to family proceedings to disclose funding arrangements of this type. The Scottish Government agrees, and Amendment 45 disapplies Section 10 in family proceedings funded by a close family member. 
that close family member will not therefore be exposed to any risk of an adverse award of expenses. Additionally, in the interest of family privacy, the pursuer will not be required to disclose the funding. Close family members are defined uh, as a spouse, civil partner, cohabitant, parent, child or sibling. Amendment 46 is a consequential on Amendment 45 and defines family proceedings for the purposes of the exception for close family members. I move Amendment 41. Thank you. John Finney to speak to Amendment 61 and other amendments in the group. Um, thank you, Convener. Uh, I would align myself with the, the, the comments of the Minister in relation to this, and I think everyone is supportive of the principle of disclosure there. But what we heard throughout our deliberations was that the intention never was that trade unions would be caught, caught up in this. So the particular wording um, that is in there is trade unions or similar body, and this will cover a range of uh, staff associations. Um, so um, um, I, I would also, um, so I hope members will support that. I also would uh, s strongly support the family privacy aspects as outlined by the Minister, which I think are a, 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 an excellent addition to the legislation. Okay. Daniel Johnson to speak to Amendment 12 and other amendments in the group. I would just simply add that I think it is important that we explicitly um, uh, exempt trade unions. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm minded to move the amendment at, the, at this point, uh, but obviously recognise that John Finney's amendment uh, largely um, uh, achieves the, the same results, so um, we'll, we'll be mindful of that. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll come to that in due time. course. Yes, yeah. you, you can see. Yeah. Okay, other members? Liam MacArthur? Welcome the um, amendments here in, in, I think, improving the transparency, which was certainly a theme we heard at, at stage at one. It was just in relation to the point you made, Minister, um, regarding uh, crowdfunding. Um, I, I, I welcome a, a bit of additional clarification around what the, uh, the provisions that have been put into the bill uh, may, uh, may imply in terms of what an individual who does receive crowdfunding might have to declare. Um, clearly, there will be individuals um, in, in any crowdfunding um, initiative who will not be known to the, to the individual, and therefore those are, are, are obviously captured in the provisions. But in a sense, there is, a, there, there is the prospect that there may be very many um, funders of small amounts that, that cumulatively uh, add up to, to a lot. Is the expectation um, that all of those would, individuals would have to be revealed uh, to the court under the provisions of the amendments that we're, uh, we're considering at this point? Uh, I, I, what I'm proposing is that um, only those uh, uh, funders who are known to the pursuer need to be disclosed. If the pursuer uh, uh, does not know who the, uh, the, the, the people are, perhaps because they're using pseudonyms, then they cannot be expected to disclose that information. Um, but I'm very happy to reflect further on these, uh, that particular aspect uh, uh, as we move to stage three, just to ensure that we are belt and braces covering what we need to cover and excluding what we need to cover. I mean, that, that's helpful. And that's welcome that clarification. I mean, as I say, I, 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 I entirely support the principle. I, I'd no, just I agree. be we'll wary about having right. something that's proportionate in, in those specific circumstances. Thanks. Okay. No other comments? The question is, amendment... Uh, was that you're winding up, Minister? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. The question is that amendment 41 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Um, call amendment 42, 43 and 44, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move amendments 42 to 44 on block. Moved on block. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 42 to 44? No. Um, the question is there, therefore that amendments 42 to 44 are agreed. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Um, I call Amendment 61 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 41. John Finney to move or not move? Moved. Um, the question is that Amendment 61 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, yes we are all agreed. So, amendment 61 is agreed. Um, call Amendment 45 in the main name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 41. Minister to move formally. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 45 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Call Amendment 46 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 41. Minister to move formally. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 46 be agreed to. Are we all, are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Um, call Amendment 12 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 41. Daniel Johnson to move formally? Uh, not moved. Not moved. Um, 
The question is that section 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Call amendment 47 in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 34. Minister to move formally. Formally moved. The question is amendment 47 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The question is that section 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Call amendment 48 in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 34. Minister to move formally. Formally moved. The question is amendment 48 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. We're not all agreed, sorry. F uh, amendment 48 to be agreed. We are not all agreed. Um, those in favour of Amendment 48, please show. Those against Amendment 48, please show. Mm -hmm. Eight for and three against. <coughs> amendment 48 is agreed. Right, where are we? Yeah, question is that Section 12 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Call the amendment 49 in the name of the Minister, already debated with amendment 34. Minister to move formally. Formally moved. The question is that amendment 49 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The question is that section 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yes, we are all agreed. Group 13, Auditors of Court, call amendment 51 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments 52, 53. 50, 53 and 54. Minister to move amendment 51 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Uh, Convener, this group is about uh, auditors of court. Section 51, 3 of the Solicitor of Scotland Act 1918, Section 2, Subsection 2, Subsection B of the Legal Profession and Legal Aid Scotland Act 2007 set out lists of auditors of court and other legal figures that are entitled to make certain complaints to the Scottish Solicitor's Discipline Tribunal and Scottish Legal Complaints Commission, respectively. These lists ought now to include the Auditor of the Sheriff Appeal Court, who is given a statutory status for the first time by Section 13 of this Bill. Amendments 51 and 52 therefore allow the Auditor of the Sheriff Appeal Court to report any wrongdoing or inadequate professional services discovered on the part of a lawyer to the appropriate authorities. Turning to Amendment 50, this provides for situations where there is a vacancy in the Office of Auditor of the Court of Session or where, for some other reason, the incumbent Auditor of the Court of Session cannot carry out his or her functions, for example, due to illness or maternity uh, uh, or other family-related leave. Amendment 50 empowers the Lord President to appoint an ad hoc office holder to act as Auditor of the Court of Session for the relevant period. This amendment was requested by the Lord President of the Court of Session has been uh, agreed uh, with uh, the Lord President's Office and the Scottish Courts and Tribunals Service. The person so appointed on a temporary basis will be treated as the Auditor of the Court of Session for most purposes, but he or she will not have any responsibility for the provision of the guidance under Section 15 of the Bill. A temporary auditor must, of course, comply with the statutory gui guidance. Turning to Amendment 53, this responds to concerns raised by the Lord President and the Scottish Courts and Tribunals Service that Section 15, as drafted, would require the Auditor of the Court of Session to produce a large tome of voluminous guidance on the taxation of judicial accounts such as currently exists in England. It was feared by the Lord President and the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service that the production of such a volume would take the Auditor away from his or her normal duties, thus potentially causing delays in the taxation of accounts and even potentially inviting satellite litigation. The amendment um, amends Section 15, Subsection 2, which is the provision requiring the Auditor of the Court of Session as head of the Auditor of Court Profession to provide guidance on practice and policy relating to the taxation of accounts of expenses. It is intended that the Auditor will provide guidance on questions of taxation of judicial accounts as they arise. This will build into a comprehensive set of guidance for practitioners. This is more consistent with the recommendations made by the Scottish Civil Courts Review, headed by the former Lord President, Lord Gill. It should not, however, be such an onerous task so as to interfere with the Auditor's um, other duties. Amendment 54 makes it clear that the Auditor of the Court of Session must nonetheless have regard when preparing guidance to the need for auditors across Scotland to exercise their functions in a manner which is consistent and is transparent. The Scottish Civil Courts Review referred to the objective of guidance as being to ensure, uh, and I quote, that a consistent approach is taken to the taxation of accounts across Scotland. This amendment will achieve uh, that uh, 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 objective uh, in terms of the uh, way we have now formulated this requirement. I move Amendment 51. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 51... Oh, sorry. Did any other members wish to, to comment? No. 
Thank you. The question is that Amendment 51 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Uh, call Amendment 52 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 51. Minister to formally move. Formally moved. Thank you. The question is Amendment 52 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The question is the schedule be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Call Amendment 50 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 51. Minister to formally move. Formally moved. Thank you. The question is Amendment 50 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that Section 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Call Amendment 53 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 51. Minister to move formally. Formally moved. Thank you. The question is Amendment 53 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Call Amendment 54 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 51. Minister to move formally. Formally moved. Right. The question is Amendment 54 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The question is that Section 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The question is that Section 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Move now to Group 14, Group Procedure, Opt Out Proceedings. Call Amendment 13 in the name of Liam MacArthur. Grouped with Amendments 14 and 15. Liam MacArthur to move Amendment 13 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, uh, Camilla. Can I start by welcoming the provisions in the Bill that allow group proceedings uh, to uh, take place under Scots law? That's very welcome, and I don't diminish the importance of that, but I do believe that an, an opportunity uh, will be missed to underscore both the ambition that we have around protections uh, for consumers if we limit ourselves simply to an opt-in model. Uh, the Minister has argued that uh, an opt-in uh, solution is, is quicker and easier to put in place. Uh, this, however, is contested by consumer uh, organisations, which will also suggest it, and I quote, risks delivering very little for very few in practice. As they make clear, breaches of consumer law invariably um, impact, have a small impact on a large number of, of people, and therefore the cumulative impact may be high, but the incentive on any, individ any single individual to bring forward legal action is perhaps very low. Uh, for legislation that's meant to be about widening access to justice, and which I, I have to say looks um, set to do that in a number of uh, areas, the current lack of ambition in relation to group proceedings uh, is a concern. That's why my amendments um, here seek to expand the options available, including the possibility of an opt-out route um, being taken. As colleagues will see, Amendment 13, which I've I have pleasure in moving, um, does not require opt-out rather than opt-in. Rather, it seeks to introduce uh, discretion to the court, taking into consideration the nature and circumstances of a case. And this reflects the approach taken in the 2016 Consumer Rights Act uh, and seems a pragmatic and reasonable way of addressing the concerns that the committee heard at stage one from which and uh, others. Uh, for the sake of com completeness, uh, Amendments 14 and 15 go on to lay out what would be required for a proficient opt-out mechanism, including the need to provide a description of a group uh, of persons whose claims are eligible, as per the Consumer Rights Act uh, 20, uh, 2015, an additional condition of the Court's assessment that reasonable measures have been taken by the representative party to identify and notify any eligible persons so that they can choose whether or not they want to opt out. And I think these additional measures should help address some of the concerns that have been raised uh, that an opt out uh, proceeding might disadvantage any person or be an administrative burden on the court by providing definitive boundaries and leaving responsibility for identification and notification uh, with the representative party. Convener, after the 1998 Competition Act introduced an opt in clause, just one action was brought in 17 years. Only with the introduction of an opt-out provision in the 2015 Consumer Rights Act have we seen a move forward in consumer protection illustrated by uh, the successful case brought against JGB Sports in 2007 over price fixing uh, for football shirts. I believe Amendments 13, 14 and 15 provide a pragmatic solution to reinforcing the measures in this bill around group proceedings. They have the potential more effectively to incentivise corporate social responsibility on the part of businesses and underpin the rights uh, of consumers. And I move Amendment 13 and look forward to uh, hearing the contributions of colleagues and the Minister. Thank you. Okay. John Finney. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I, I speak in support of Liam MacArthur's amendments here, and I think the key word that he used for me was opportunity. Um, 
we deal with complex legislation. This shouldn't be about the ease of wh by which this can be uh, applied. I think we heard some very compelling examples which, uh, of, uh, of practice which this, these amendments would support. And I, I think it's important we try and make it better for the future. So I support the amendments in Liam's name. Daniel Johnson. Uh, I too would just like to speak strongly in support of uh, Liam MacArthur's amendments. I, I think they um, uh, will be uh, would be extremely useful. Uh, I think the, the, the examples he set out um, and also the impact of uh, opt-out uh, uh, sorry, opt-in leg uh, legislation that we have south of the border, I think it leads you to the conclusion that I think opt-out would be extremely useful. I think the, the, the situations where there are a large number of people suffering from a, a very low level um, uh, uh, cost, I, I think makes it quite compelling. Um, and um, uh, for those reasons, I, I, I strongly support these amendments. Any more comments? Uh, I also welcome this amendment. I think, um, along with Liam McCarthy and John Finney, there is an opportunity here. And I do think the amendment strikes the right balance in giving the court the discretion to go to the opt-out um, procedure if they deem that to be the best option. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, I am pleased indeed as well that the proposal to introduce group proceedings otherwise known as class actions to the Scottish courts has broad support. Um, picking up on Mr MacArthur's um, uh, description of my position, I too do not lack ambition, but I perhaps am more of a pragmatist um, as a government minister. Uh, and perhaps I can now flesh out the reasons why uh, I, I take that view at this stage. And of course it is... Um, the position that it's not just the Scottish Government, but most stakeholders, uh, including the Faculty of Advocates, the Law Society of Scotland, the STUC, and the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers, are, are convinced that the best way forward is to proceed at this time by way of an introduction of an opt-in system. Uh, this uh, principally is because it will be more straightforward to implement, easier to understand for potential <coughs> litigants, and easier to administer for practitioners. There will also not be undue delay in commencing the procedure. Uh, the Scottish Government does not have any financial or political objections to opt-out, and the decision to go for opt-in at this stage has been for purely, as I say, practical reasons. Uh, uh, it is to be borne in mind, of course, that group procedure, notwithstanding the, the clever drafting of Mr MacArthur's uh, uh, amendment, uh, uh, number 13, but of course, and referred to by the convener, but of course the, the discretion of the court, there still have to be court rules in place, and that is where we get, I think, to one of the, the nubs of the matter. Because group procedure will require, of course, new court rules, you know, from the, 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 the get-go, whatever kind of procedure it is, will require new court rules to be drafted by the Scottish Civil Justice Council. And some of the issues relating to opt-out, the opt-out option, are much more complicated than those for the opt-in option. And to mention perhaps just two issues, opt-out will imply that people may become part of litigation without their consent and possibly without their knowledge. And that would have to be addressed in court rules. Also, the concept of aggregated or global damages sits uneasily with Scots law, which adheres to the compensatory principle. Uh, no stakeholder has yet proposed a scheme that would ensure that individual claimants are not under or over compensated. Uh, moreover, members will have seen that the Lord President has written to the committee commenting that any extension of the group proceedings provisions in the bill should be approached with considerable caution. He went on to say that the practical and legal challenges presented by an opt-out model are significantly greater than those presented by an opt-in model. The government therefore believes that it would take the Scottish Civil Justice Council far longer to draft rules for both the opt-in and opt-out procedures from uh, the same starting point. Uh, and, and that would be required, as I say, if Amendment 13 were to be accepted by the, the, the committee because uh, we would still need to have court rules in place in order to follow a procedure. Uh, and whether or not the court exercise discretion to follow an opt-out, you would still need to have court rules in place. And it has been explained why, uh, from a starting point, it would, be, uh, it would take longer to uh, formulate those court rules, certainly. If, if your view ultimately is going to be that you wouldn't be supportive of this, um, when would you think it would be appropriate time to move to this um, system? Um, well, I think that's a very uh, practical question. I, I, I think where we are with this is that, first of all, um, if we proceed as proposed in, in the bill as it currently stands, that we start with opt-in because it's start, starting somewhere, as was indeed highlighted by several of the uh, uh, 
those who gave evidence before the Justice Committee, then it will take some time even to get the opt-in procedures going. But it may well be there for that, and I think we're getting on to discuss post-legislative scrutiny provisions in, in the next grouping of amendments. Uh, but it may well be that that would be the, the perfect time to see where matters have got to. Uh, and so there's no question of kicking this into touch forever. It is simply, uh, uh, my view is inspired by the, the pragmatic considerations that have been raised uh, with me uh, about the need to get on with this, given we heard in committee that this has been a subject that has been the subject of discussion for many decades now, and we need to get on with it and start somewhere. And if we make it too complicated from the start, we risk delaying the whole thing. So instead of being able to start at least with some opt-in proceedings, we may find ourselves, and I'm sure that's not the intention of, uh, the, uh, the, of Mr MacArthur at all, but we may, as an unintended consequence, find ourselves in a position where we have no class actions possible for, for a considerably longer period of time because we are trying to be too ambitious uh, at, at the outset. So it, it could delay class actions per se, would be my uh, concern. Uh, as I say, a number of, of uh, people before the committee did uh, give evidence effectively to, to that effect, taking a more pragmatic view, not that they did not wish to see opt out, they did, but they took a more pragmatic uh, approach perhaps, for example, Paul Brown of the Legal Services Agency and his evidence uh, to the uh, committee. And it is a simultaneous joint introduction of the two uh, processes, one of which is extremely complex because, as I say, it introduces into Scott's uh, civil procedure elements that we don't currently uh, wrestle with, then I think that there is a fear of uh, delay uh, uh, to all uh, class actions. Um, uh, Mr MacArthur, just to pick up on one point, or maybe Mr Johnson, sorry, um, th there was a reference to the, um, the experience of the UK Competition Appeals Tribunal where class actions have uh, been possible, and I think it was which that flagged this up, but we're not sure that the experience of that tribunal is uh, is typical since it, with, before that tribunal there are a particularly large number of claimants in competition actions and competition law is highly specialised and a technical area of law and we therefore believe that it would be much more straightforward to introduce opt-in as the, the, the starting point, uh, an opt-in scheme in Scotland where we have a much smaller jurisdiction. So that is perhaps something to bear uh, in mind as well. So uh, uh, for all those reasons, uh, convener, I would therefore ask the committee not to support the Liam MacArthur's Amendment 13. Uh, and um, uh, I also, as I say, in response to Mr Finney's point, do recognise that this absolutely is an area of the bill that would be ripe for post-legislative scrutiny, uh, assuming that the grouping of amendments we are shortly to get to, that that amendment is uh, approved by the committee. Um, I would say also, though, that um, I would be happy to support Liam MacArthur's amendments 14 and 15, which are potentially, use, potentially useful additions to the proposals for opt-in group proceedings. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, I uh, would emphasise just in closing that, of course, we are not closing the door on opt-out. Uh, I simply am guided by pragmatism, whereby I wish to see class actions as a possibility in Scotland as soon as we possibly can. Court rules need to be drafted. It would be easier to start with opt-in and then move to opt-out. Post-ledge scrutiny would give, the, uh, would give members, I hope, the assurance that this is not an attempt to kick this into touch. If we are to start from a starting point of having to come up with court rules for both opt-in and opt-out, I really fear that we will see no class actions for years to come because of the complexity of uh, that approach. Thank you, convener. Okay. Liam MacArthur to wind up. Press over to uh, Thank you. Can I thank the Minister and indeed uh, colleagues for the contributions and, and thank yourself, convener, and uh, John Finney and Daniel Johnson for your strong support for these uh, amendments. I think there seems to be a tussle over uh, who has greater claim to, um, to, to the badge of pragmatism. Um, so let me, let me stake my claim uh, again. I think the amendments and the way that I've uh, sought to cast them uh, do strike the balance, recognising some of the complexities, recognising um, the, uh, the need for uh, court discretion in taking these forward. Now, the Minister quite uh, fairly pointed out this. We still require uh, amendments to uh, rules of, of court. Uh, but nevertheless, I think um, given the strength of the evidence we've heard from, from which, and, and I don't uh, entirely dismiss the concerns of uh, the, the opponents cited uh, by the Minister, but nevertheless, I think as, um, uh, as a representative of consumers' interests, uh, we need to uh, 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 ascribe a suitable uh, amount of weight to the concerns that uh, which 
have expressed. And, and I think while direct comparisons between the um, uh, situation uh, north and south of the border are, are probably fraught with, with difficulties, and I hear what the Minister said uh, in relation to um, the, the actions of the Tribunal, nevertheless, it's taken uh, 17 years um, south of the border to move from the 1998 Competition Act to the 2015 Consumer Rights Act. And I think we should also be able to draw um, some uh, optimism from the fact that the Consumer Rights Act 2015 um, does demonstrate that uh, an opt-out model is not beyond uh, the wit of man uh, to construct and to construct in a way that allows group proceedings to, to, uh, to come forward. Uh, as Daniel Johnson pointed out and reminded us, uh, this affects high numbers but have a low impact. And therefore, I think uh, unless we address that, we miss the opportunity that John uh, Finney raised um, in, in his contribution and say, on that basis, uh, I'm minded to move. Yes, of course. Uh, just on that point, how, how do you respond, Liam MacArthur, to the Minister's point about the delay? That it, it sounds as though, from what the Minister was saying, that uh, by making this amendment, uh, we potentially kick the whole thing quite a long way into the future. Uh, and if I'm hearing the Minister right, isn't it better to get the opt in going? Uh, and then look at the opt-out, perhaps at the post-legislative scrutiny stage, uh, rather than potentially put the whole thing back for potentially some considerable time. Well, I, and it's, it's not an un unreasonable point uh, at all. I think the question, of the, 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 the counter to that is that um, I dare say that uh, which have no interest in seeing group proceedings uh, delayed uh, unduly. But there's an opportunity at this stage to introduce a mechanism um, that embeds opt-in, but also leaves open the option for, uh, to, for, for courts uh, to decide on a, an, an opt-out uh, mechanism. Uh, that we saw the delays uh, in, in what happened south of the border that stretched for some considerable time, as I say, um, 17 years. Uh, I think there's a bit of a risk that we, we hang our hat uh, on uh, post-legislative scrutiny as some how allowing us um, to return to this uh, and, and address it at, at that stage. I dare say that there will be those at that stage in five years' time uh, who suggest that it's still awfully complicated and it will uh, be terribly difficult to amend the rules of court and that we kick the can further down the road. I think we have an opportunity here, while there's pressure in the pipe to, to introduce group proceedings under an opt-in model, um, to take that further step, take additional time, uh, that's I think accepted, take additional time to come forward with a mechanism that allows opt-out proceedings in certain circumstances uh, and, and in accordance with, uh, with, with uh, court discretion. So on that basis, um, I, I am minded to press ahead with uh, Amendment uh, 13. Thank you. Okay. The question is, Amendment 13, be agreed to all agreed? Yes. No. We're not all agreed. There will be a division. All those in favour, please show. All those against? Six in favour, five against. Amendment 13 is agreed to. Call Amendment 14 in the name of Liam MacArthur, already debated with Amendment 13. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is, Amendment 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Um, call Amendment 15 in the name of Liam MacArthur, already debated with Amendment 13. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? Moved. Move. The question is, Amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are Moved. all agreed. The question is that Section 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Yes, we are all agreed. The question is that Section 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Now move to Group 15, the final group, post-legislative review. Call Amendment 55 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendment 62 and 56. Minister to move Amendment 55 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. During the Stage 1 debate, a number of calls were made for post-legislative scrutiny of the legislation in five years. This committee, in its Stage 1 report in the bill, also asked the Scottish Government to commit to post-legislative scrutiny of the bill within five years of its provisions coming into force. In particular, it was concerned that the review should look at the impact of, of uh, qualified one-way cost shifting. I have listened to the arguments, and I am persuaded that post-legislative scrutiny is appropriate for the special circumstances of this particular bill. This does not, however, mean that the government accepts that a statutory requirement for post-legislative scrutiny is appropriate for all legislation passed by this parliament. The government continues to believe that there is a need to take a flexible and proportionate approach to post-legislative scrutiny so that time and resources are targeted effectively. And we look forward to working with the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in this regard. 
Government Amendment 55 provides for post-legislative scrutiny of each of Parts 1 to 3 of the Bill five years after each part is fully commenced. In the case of Part 4, on group proceedings, the five-year period will commence from the day in which the first rules of court for group proceedings come into force. This different arrangement is considered to be required because the detail of the procedures for group proceedings will be provided in rules of court to be brought forward by the Scottish Civil Justice Council, which will draft and consult on the rules of court that are to govern group procedure. Group proceedings cannot take place until such rules are in force. There is therefore arguably no point in triggering the five-year period for post legislative scrutiny of group proceedings until they have actually taken place and had a chance to bid in over the proposed five-year period. The post-legislative reports envisaged in the Bill will require consultation with appropriate stakeholders. They will have to be laid before the Scottish Parliament as soon as practicable after the relevant report has been prepared and then published. The post-legislative scrutiny will provide an opportunity to look at how various key parts of the Act are operating and whether amendment is necessary. For example, the Part 1 provisions as amended on the future element of damages, taking into account the likely addition at that time of specific damages legislation. The post legislative scrutiny of part two will allow, as the committee has requested, a review of the operation of qualified one-way cost shifting and how the grounds on which quartz protection are lost are operating in practice, since they are intended to facilitate meritorious claims whilst discouraging spurious claims. Post legislative scrutiny of part two will also allow consideration of whether quartz should be extended to other areas of civil litigation in addition to personal injury actions. As regards post legislative scrutiny of part four of the bill, most stakeholders have agreed uh, that opt-in is the practical option for the introduction of group proceedings. However, we have heard uh, the committee's view on that uh, just uh, a moment ago. Um, so, uh, that Amendment 55 would seek to uh, link the post legislative scrutiny, in effect, to the timing of uh, the entry into force of the various parts, not to belabour uh, the point. Uh, amendment 56, convener, will mean that the whole of the new part will come into force automatically two months after royal assent. Uh, convener, uh, your amendment number 62 appears to have much the same purpose as the government's objective in amendment 55. And although it embodies differences from the government's proposal, I am willing to support uh, the, the convener's uh, amendment number 62. As with other non-government amendments we are supporting at stage two, the government will consider whether any refinements, refinements are required and bring them forward at stage three if necessary. And this may indeed be necessary for us to reflect. Therefore, if uh, Margaret Mitchell's amendment uh, is duly agreed to, uh, we may nonetheless be required to reflect on, on the, uh, the rationale of, of the timing of the review as it pertains to particular parts of uh, the bill. Um, so that is where we are um, on the basis that um, the uh, on the basis that I need to move the amendment in order for the group to be considered, I believe I do move amendment 55 at this time though that is only to allow debate to take place on the rest of the group of amendments. Thank you, Convener. Uh, thank the Minister for that. Uh, amendment 62 is in my name, which I now speak to. Um, I think um, it actually complements the, the Minister's Amendment 55. Both amendments insert provisions for post-legislative review of the operation of the Act as soon as practicable after uh, five years and to lay before Parliament a report on the review. However, in the Stage 1 report, the Committee specifically asked the Scottish Government to commit to post-legislative scrutiny of the Bill within five years of its provision coming into force and, in particular, to review the impact of introducing qualified one-way cost shifting in Section 8 of the Bill. Amendment 62 therefore specifically calls for a review of the effect and operation of Section 8 and COPSI, which represents a radical departure from the traditional loser pays principle. It also specifically calls for a review of the effect and operation of Section 17 on group proceedings, in including the group proceedings opt-in approach, and now that the committee has agreed Liam MacArthur's amendment, it would include uh, a review of the opt-out provision as well. Um, and how Section 8 and Section 17 affects access to justice and administration of Scottish courts. Amendment 62 states that the report must include a statement by a Scottish Minister setting out whether they intend to bring forward proposals to modify any provision in this Act. 
and where no such proposals are brought forward, the reason for not doing so. As such, this amendment covers all provisions in the Minister's amendment, but specifically provides for quoxits as, most, as the most contentious aspect of the bill to be reviewed with further scrutiny of its operation together with the, S, uh, the Section 17 uh, group proceedings. Uh, other members to comment? No. If there are no other minister, do you wish to wind yes, up? Yes, just uh, to say briefly, uh, convener, that um, of course post legislative scrutiny will permit a number of complex and technical aspects of the bill, uh, as you've highlighted, to be reconsidered in the light of five years of operation of the bill. I must emphasise again that the government does not believe that post legislative scrutiny is necessary on every single piece of legislation, but we will, as I said, work with the Public Audit and Post Legislative Scrutiny Committee in this regard. To summarise, uh, in light of the convener's comments, I will not press Amendment 55 in my name. I do support Amendment 62 in the name of Margaret Mitchell and will reflect, as with all Stage 2 amendments, if the committee uh, accepts that amendment, I will reflect uh, whether any refinements may be uh, required uh, uh, when we come to Stage 3. Thank you, convener. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anyone object to Amendment 55 being withdrawn? No objections. Thank you for that. Call Amendment 62 in my name, already debated with Amendment 55, which um, I now move. The question is that Amendment 62 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Uh, call Amendment 16 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 11. Daniel Johnson to move or not to move. I'll move. Move. Um, the question is that Amendment 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Mm -hmm. We are not all agreed. There will be a division. All those in five of Amendment 16, please show. All those in favour of Amendment 16, please show. Sorry, no, we did all in favour. All those against. Oh, sorry. I did all in favour, did I? Yeah. Did we have the show of hands? I'll just show it again. <coughs> okay. Yeah. All those in favour of Amendment 16? Right. All those against? Apologies. Five, four, and... Sorry. We couldn't really... See, could Clark see who was voting? Can we take it again? All those in favour, please show. All right. All those against, please show. That's six in favour, five against. So the amendment is agreed. Um, the question is that section 19 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Are we all agreed out there? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the question is that section 20 and 21 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Call amendments 56 in the name of the Minister, already debated with amendment 55. Minister to formally move. Formally moved. The question is that amendment 56 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Call Amendment 17 in the name of Liam Kerr, already debated with Amendment 34. Liam Kerr to move or not move? Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 17 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. We are all agreed. The question no. is... Sorry, we're no. not all agreed. No. Sorry. No. <laughs> we're not all agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. All, okay. All those against? Four in favour, seven against. Four in favour, seven against. The amendment is not agreed. Call amendment 65 in the name of Gordon Lindhurst. A very debated with amendment 18 on day one. Gordon Lindhurst to move or not move? Uh, moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 65 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against? Three in favour. Three in favour, eight against. The amendment is not agreed. The question is that section 22 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The question is that section 23 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. That ends stage two consideration of the bill. An amended, uh, an amended stage two version of the bill will now be printed. The Parliament has not yet agreed uh, when Stage 3 proceedings will take place, but members can, however, lodge Stage 3 amendments at any time with the clerks in the legislation team.
The deadline for log lodging stage three amendments will be announced as soon as it's known. Minister, can I thank you and your officials for attending. I suspend briefly to allow uh, the, the, witness, the minister and our officials to leave.
Agenda item three is an evidence session on alternative dispute resolution. I refer members to paper one, which is noted by the clerk, and paper two, which is private paper. And welcome to the meeting, Nikos Kolarius, Secretary of CAM Scotland, Isabella Ennis, Chair Family Law Arbitration Group Scotland, Rosanna Cubitt, Head of Practice Mediation Relationship Scotland, and Dr. Marshall Scott, Chief Executive of Scottish Women's Aid. Can I thank all the win witnesses who did provide the committee with written evidence? That's always tremendously helpful to the, the committee before we, we hold one of these evidence sessions. And we now move to questions, starting with John Finney. Good morning, panel. Just a question to maybe start us off, please. Uh, could, could you uh, outline the types of, um, if we call it ADR right at the, the start, maybe, um, alternative dispute resolution that are used in family law cases in Scotland? and describe the key fe features of the methods used, please. Well, I think uh, if we're talking about alternative dispute resolution uh, in the legal sense, then the alternative is alternative to litigation. Uh, so aside from litigation, family law arbitration is a litigious process in that it's adversarial. There is an appointed, a joint appointed decision maker. Both parties agree on who the decision maker is. In flags, that decision maker is a specialist family lawyer, either a solicitor or an advocate. And they have had arbitration training spe specific to family law. They're a member of flags, which is an organization which has produced its own rules, uh, has its own committee. And the, the parties with their legal representatives enter into a contract, the agreement to arbitrate, and that governs the matter of the dispute. So if they're uh, in dispute about where the children should be spending time, they contract that that's the scope of the arbitration, and they enter into it with solicitors and the clients and the arbitrator. The manner in which the dispute is resolved is a matter, again, of agreement, so they can resolve it by evidence, by written submissions. They can resolve it in any location that suits them. So if they are in a remote location, they can enter into the process uh, by Skype or telephone. The arbitrator can go to them. Uh, so there is a huge amount of flexibility, but it's a process that engages you having generally your own legal representative and an independent decision maker with a specialisation in family law. Yes, thank you. Another alternative will be uh, mediation. So I think you've already had discussions around that, so you probably have a, a sense of what that is. So, if, and in Scotland, family mediation is provided by Relationship Scotland and CALM primarily. There are a couple of private providers, but that's the... The main. So do you want me to kind of explain yes, how that, how that, that works? Please, yes. um, Please. So parties can uh, choose to uh, meet with an independent um, mediator who, so they will initially have a uh, one-to-one -one meeting to find out about mediation and explore whether that's appropriate for their um, circumstances. And then they would meet with the mediator and the mediator would basically help them to have a conversation and to explore what the issues are and to then reach agreement, but it would be the party's agreement. The mediator doesn't impose a decision on the parties. So it's quite a creative process. It's particularly for family cases where there are children, and a lot of the issues are quite nuanced around where the children uh, might live and how they can manage their arrangements going forward. Then it's actually a very flexible and creative um, process to explore options. Um, family mediation in Scotland is also protected uh, from a confidentiality point of view. So what's said in mediation uh, isn't uh, taken to court. If, if the case collapsed and it goes to court, um, what happens in mediation is protected and isn't, is confidential. So that allows parties to um, try things out, uh, feel free to talk about things without feeling like it's going to be used against them in court. So it's a very productive and creative process. Thank you. Can mediators um, experienced family law solicitors who have uh, trained to become mediators. So we have that dual um, uh, qualification of being solicitors um, in family law and, and also trained to become mediators. Um, and the, the process that's offered is, is similar to, to the, that Roseanne has uh, outlined. 
When a case is referred to mediation, uh, it's referred to a calm mediator. Uh, we would firstly meet with the parties individually, obviously to assess um, suitability for mediation, but also to obtain a bit of background before thereafter engaging with the parties jointly in, in joint mediation sessions. I have been a solicitor for 35 years and a, and, a, and a mediator for in excess of 20 years and from a very early stage. Personally, I recognised that the courts were not always the best place to try and resolve disputes, particularly in relation to family disputes. Um, I, I deal with uh, contact cases, uh, residence cases primarily uh, in mediation, but also quite a number of, uh, of cases involving financial um, aspects arising from separation. Uh, more recently, I've dealt with uh, wider uh, type of cases, uh, relocation cases uh, in mediation, and uh, more recently, cases involving family members, but in other areas such as disputes over estates or even family businesses as well. I am a, uh, an enthusiast for mediation. Uh, being a solicitor as well, I still think mediation is far and away the best way to resolve most disputes, but particularly family disputes. Um, it offers... Uh, the party is the opportunity to be heard, uh, first and foremost. We use the, the, the words uh, empowering parties. One of the, the, the comments I frequently hear at mediation when people go to court is that they do not feel that they have been properly heard. And mediation gives them a chance to, to speak, and not just for a few minutes, but uh, an hour, two hour sessions. Uh, they, they can very much have their say uh, as to what is what's concerning them. Um, it, it very much puts the parties uh, front and centre of the resolution of, of the dispute. It gives them the power and the permission to consider solutions that suit them, not solutions that are imposed on them. Uh, and, it, and, and particularly the mediation process, I think, um, which, which is a, a problem, I think, with the court, is it gives people the time to drill down and look at uh, much detail that's required in, in the circumstances, arrange, arrangements for children, for example. Um, generally, mediation will last uh, as long as it takes. Uh, we have uh, two individual joint sessions, then, uh, so in individual sessions, then we have joint sessions. The number of joint sessions will vary from perhaps two or three to, to perhaps longer, very much dependent on the parties. Uh, but the, the facility is there for the parties to, to return to mediation and to review and um, uh, adapt to, to any changing circumstances that may be required. I think that's one of the, the important points about mediation is that opportunity to, to try things out and then to come back and maybe tweak the arrangements a bit. Or, as is often the case with families further down the line, something will change. One of the parties might get a new partner or there might be a new baby so they can come back. And, and children, obviously, their needs as they get older change. So the, if, if it's good to have that opportunity to explore... What to do. If I could just add one other thing about, about the benefits of mediation is that uh, we very much look for longer term solutions. Um, the court system is designed to give uh, a decision on a particular set of circumstances and obviously we have to address any short term requirements, any short term issues that are in mediation uh, situations that have to be resolved. But we do tend to look, particularly when we're dealing with uh, families where there are younger children, one of, the, thing, one of the, the points we try to get across to the parties is you may no longer be partners, you may have separated yourselves, but if you have children that are two or three years of age, you will be parents for a very long time uh, and you will have to cooperate. So we try to encourage parties to take a longer term view on, 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 their, on their problems. Again, on numerous occasions when I deal with mediation, I, I hear relatively young people uh, in their 20s who relate back to the unfortunate experiences they had when they were younger um, with, with broken families and, and a realisation that they don't want that to happen again for their children. And that's where we can encourage them to think longer term. It's not just all about taking out their, uh, their, their hurt or their anger on the other person. It's to try and overcome that and to think longer term for the benefit of the children. And that is, is another point I think we try to emphasise greatly in mediation. The, the children are the most important people here. Um, it is what is in their best interest, and we constantly have to remind parties that uh, they, they really have to put the children first, not their own feelings. Can I, thank you very much. Can I ask Dr Scott about the appropriateness of um, whether there are women involved in violence? You, you make a, a specific comment in your evidence. We are aware there will be times for women participate in the mediation process because they're unaware of the right not to. 
Absolutely. Um, I, I think I'll just want to frame my remarks by saying that, in general, Scottish Women's Aid supports alternative dispute resolution and mediation, just not in the context of domestic abuse. Um, and uh, we, we know that this discussion has been had before in Scotland, it has been going on for many years, and in part, um, I think it's uh, been difficult to resolve because there is a, quite a sizable evidence base that says that women and children can be put at risk and in fact harmed in the context of mediation when domestic abuse is part of the picture. Um, the, and we very much welcome the input from Relationship Scotland around mediation not being appropriate in the context of domestic abuse. Our concerns are, if you think about the prevalence of domestic abuse, it's one out of four women in Scotland. If you think about the number of um, uh, uh, relationship breakups, um, to, to use the phrase that's common, uh, that, that might involve or, may, or do involve domestic abuse that are not evident in the, in the, process, in the public um, eye. And those come from a variety of places. They come from the fact that women are routinely, and we have some research that's just about to come out again to confirm empirically that this is true, um, advised by their lawyers not to mention domestic abuse when they're, go when they're involved in a court case, especially around child contact. Um, uh, and we're very concerned at the fact that Mediation is going on in Scotland at the moment with women who are experiencing domestic abuse. And it's not because there are ill-intentioned mediators who, who wish to you know, just put domestic abuse um, aside, although you know, I think it has been put aside. It's because the system is not competent around domestic abuse. And it's a very scary thought for us, as we know, have some, some proposals have been made about having um, even just mandatory meetings about mediation um, because we're, we are very well aware that, that, um, that women's voices are not equal in a mediation relationship and that um, they are often pressured into that through a variety of mechanisms from their partner, from their lawyer, from um, the, whole, the, whole, the way the whole civil justice system works. We have consistent reports from our services that this is an ongoing issue, and I just got one last week, and I'm going to share a bit of it with you. Dear Marcia, sorry to bother you, but I need to escalate an issue in here. I'm not going to tell you where it is, because the, the, um, the manager of the service has quite a good relationship with Relationship Scotland. They, they manage cases together sometimes in the contact center, and they would like to preserve that. Um, one of our clients who has interdicts for her children in a non-harassment order in place against her husband for 100 years, so you can imagine the level of abuse there must have been in that case, by our local court has received an invitation to come to mediation with her husband. We have had our local PF in the office this morning and he is shocked that this is happening, as are we. It was a high profile case here and we feel the perpetrator is still trying to get to her. Um, we feel that family mediation is totally inappropriate and our client is very disturbed to have been invited to it and most worried because she has multiple children and she is worried that they will also receive letters of invitation as they come from age, come to age and she will have no way to protect them. Um, I, again, I have to just underline that this is an issue around competence across the piece family lawyers, you know, mediators, um, you know, all kinds of folks in the system. And as we heard in the debate around the do new domestic abuse law, um, the, the understanding about the actual dynamics of domestic abuse across the public sector can be very shallow. And I think it is really, really important that we understand what the unintended <coughs> negative consequences of privileging mediation in the system are until we change that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, supplementaries, Daniel, then Fulton. So very much following on from, from those comments, I mean, when I sort of hear the opening statements that the, the advantage of mediation being uh, the flexibility uh, and about making sure the voices are heard, but also sort of hearing the point about it being predicated on both sides having access to um, uh, representation, does make me wonder to what extent it's predicated on 
the notion that, that there's a sort of a, 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 a the symmetry between both parties, uh, both in terms of, of, of power, resource, and ability to articulate their, their situation. And I'm just wondering what the issues are with arbitration, because not even the, the, the points around domestic abuse are, 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 are very well made and, and, and are obviously at one end of the spectrum, but there are a lot of scenarios where there's just an asymmetry of, of the ability to really state uh, one's case, where I, I, you could see that, that mediation or, or, or arbitration would have some issues if one party was just able to put their points forward better than the other side. I was just wondering what the panel, you know, what, 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 what they would say to that observation. Who would like to take that? I think in family law arbitration, the, the purpose of the arbitrator as an expert family lawyer is to ensure that the, the process is fair. The, the Arbitration Scotland Act the first obligation is to ensure that the process is fair, uh, efficient, uh, is, meets all the requirements of natural justice. Now, in family law arbitration, you would generally have each side represented also by a family lawyer. The imbalance in representation and power would only occur if one party could afford the, the arbitration process and the other party couldn't. Mm. At the moment, the Scottish Legal Aid Board does not fund uh, family law arbitration, which means that access to efficient, expert, tailored family law justice is not available if you are not uh, financially capable of funding it. So that is a big problem. But aside from that uh, fiscal imbalance, if you are appearing before a family law arbitrator, you have the protection of the arbitrator and you have the protection of your legal representative in the same way that you would if you were in court. The advantage of family law arbitration is that the arbitrator brings to the table an enormous wealth of experience in family cases so they understand not just the the point in dispute, but the raft of reasons that lie behind bringing that point to a, a, an adjudication, the enormous amount of backstory, the understand that there are subtle issues that are at play that might not be evident because they have the experience that a sheriff or a judge may not have. In mediation, there is, no, there is no direct representation in the mediation process. Um, however, we, we do uh, frequently advise parties in mediation to still consult with their own solicitor. So th the solicitors are there in the background to provide advice. And uh, it's certainly my practice and, and I think the practice of, of all, all CAM mediators, and I'm sure the same with Relationship Scotland, Nobody would ever be forced to make a decision there and then in the context of mediation without first being given the opportunity to seek advice. So the representation is slightly different in mediation. The other point I would make, you I think the question you're asking primarily is about power imbalances. Um, and, and that is something we are trained on, yeah. to recognise power imbalances. And there are various ways we can deal with that. If we feel that one party is being dominated, we can separate the parties, we can speak to parties individually. There are different models, there is flexibility to, to address such power imbalances. If we as mediators feel the power imbalance is too great, mm -hmm. then we would, we would probably stop the mediation process. Uh, we, we are very, very conscious of, of, of these particular issues. Okay. So, sorry, Marcia Scott might have some comments. I think um, I would... I would say that there's a, a sort of generic equality impact assessment that would that would um, shine some light on these issues. I think um, uh, particularly women and women, whether they're experiencing domestic abuse or not, we know are more likely to be poor, much less likely to have access to a solicitor. Um, uh, their access of legal aid is often quite problematic. Um, their access to legal aid is often quite problematic. Uh, and, and I think that they, you know, in in general, walk into those kinds of um, negotiations uh, at a disadvantage. I think that mediation is, um, you know, intended to try and redress some of those disadvantages, but I suspect that it is only 
partially successful in doing so. Can I, yeah, can I just add, I mean, in terms of cases where domestic abuse is an issue, then absolutely I agree with Marsha that mediation wouldn't be appropriate. Um, and I would agree with Nikos is what he's saying about the mediation process is actually uh, part of the job of the mediator is to give people an opportunity to speak and to be heard. And actually, some of the research for not in domestic abuse cases, but for some women actually creates the opportunity for them to have a voice because you can slow things down and you can... Uh, it's often that one party is more articulate than the other, mm. not necessarily that way around always, but the role of the mediator is to allow that conversation to happen and for the one that's less articulate to have the opportunity to speak. And for many people, that actually is giving them an opportunity and empowering them. So you're giving them power where maybe they didn't have it before. So that's a really important part of the role of the mediator. Can I just add one thing? I am, um, as a children's rights organization, Scotland, uh, Scottish Women's Aid is uh, constantly worried about the lack of, of children and young people's voices in decisions that are made about their lives. And I think um, in the context of mediation, we have a lot of, um, exploration to do about how how is it that children's voices, not as a one-off, but as as actual participants in decision making, can be reflected. And I am not clear that that we know the answer to that. So, and Relationship Scotland mediators, some go on to do additional training where they can meet with children if that's appropriate, if the parents agree, and if the child, if it seems like that would be a good opportunity for the child, then mediators can meet with the child and feed their views back into the mediation process. So there is that facility to hear children's voices within the mediation process. Again, if I could just add in family law arbitration, uh, a decision about the welfare of a child has to be determined in terms of Scots law and the, the Children's Scotland Act imposes an obligation to take into account the views of the child. So the arbitrator is uh, obliged to do that so the voice of the child would be heard but it's important I, I think to note that the power imbalance in mediation uh, can exist because slab funds mediation and so the less uh, fiscally flush might feel forced to go to mediation because that will be funded mm. and an alternative dispute resolution service like arbitration which may be more suitable for them is not open to them because of the lack of funding so we are not serving uh, all of the community fairly if we prohibit through economic imbalance the access to alternative dispute resolution through family law arbitration. Okay, we've got two more supplementaries, Fulton, Lorna, and then we're going on to Liam MacArthur. Thanks, convener, and uh, good morning, panel. I suppose my uh, question is for, uh, for, for Dr Scott um, mainly. Do you think, given the prevalence of domestic violence and the passing of the new legislation, um, which I think has sent out quite a clear message about what we think of such offences uh, and behaviour in this country, do you think that um, the, the, there should be a robust screening process about whether people are suitable for mediation eh, or similar types of processes. Firstly, because if it's appropriate at all, eh, if there's been domestic violence, and secondly, the point that Rosanne was making, whether then, yes, if there's been eh, that behaviour there, then is it actually still within the interest of main, mainly women eh, to go forward? But, but a most robust screening process to detect it early. What would your thoughts be on that? Um, I think it's really important to avoid a binary here of, you know, no, yes, no mediation, nothing else kind of question. And I think um, uh, Isabel raised a really good point, which is um, that women may well, in fact, feel like it's their best option given a limited set of very bad options. Um, and part of the, the, you know, the two hard box involved here is that women do not have access to legal advice and, and, and support and representation. Um, when they need it uh, routinely in Scotland. I would say that um, part of our concerns is not only do we have ample, as I mentioned, empirical evidence that women are being um, coerced into mediation or uh, in, uh, uh, in many places in Scotland, 
we don't, we're very concerned that a one meeting assessment, um, given that, that that evidence is clearly not an adequate assessment process. And um, from so much of the, the evidence that was given during the bill, uh, the, the consideration of the bill, we know that um, it, women or, women's voices are discounted around their experiences all the time. And it is highly unlikely that a woman who has, um, uh, is, has few resources and is being um, uh, assessed for whether there's domestic abuse is going to disclose in a one-off one um, uh, meeting from somebody who probably has not an enormous amount of training for assessing that. And when we're talking about coercive control and we're not talking about physical violence and we probably are not talking about a police record that can be referred to in most of these cases, then it is highly unlikely that that system is going to be sensitive enough to, to, to establish safety in the mediation. Does that answer your question? It, it does. I think you've, you've made the point very, very clearly. Could I have an additional point for the um, panel members? We're on to supplementaries just now, and there'll be a, probably okay, a, an opportunity in, okay. further on. Rona? Right, Thank you, convener. <laughs> yes, can, can I ask Dr Scott um, whether Women's Aid think it's acceptable for mediation to be used in, for child contact where there's no domestic abuse involved? And I'm talking in relation to the issues with child contact centres. Um, when there's no domestic abuse involved, mm -hmm. we don't have an opinion. Okay. okay. Um, the, it's, that's a really big when, though. And um, as, as I've mentioned prior to this, we, you know, we know that so many cases wind up, um, contact cases wind up where domestic abuse has not been flagged up, where it exists very clearly. Um, so we're, we are quite concerned, and we think the way to solve the problem is not to, to to just keep filtering an infinitely smaller number of cases into the mediation, and then the others we don't have a solution for. Mm -hmm. I think we really need to, to, to take a look at the fact that um, the system at the moment really coerces women into being quiet, mm -hmm. and how do we address that? Yeah. So you're saying an alternative solution should be found? For yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, Can I pick up yeah. on uh, some of the points that Marsha has made? I don't think that, that anybody in this room would underestimate the, the impact of domestic abuse and the seriousness of it. Um, I would, however, like to slightly differ. I don't think uh, that it should be discounted in all cases. Um, I think uh, that there are many cases where women who are subject to domestic abuse still need to get matters resolved, whether it's to do with uh, children, child contact, or financial issues. Um, and I think mediation, um, talking from the mediation perspective, can certainly offer uh, some assistance with that, subject to the right model being, uh, being chosen uh, and the appropriate safeguards being put in place. Um, I, I think CAM as an organisation has engaged with Scottish Women's Aid. Uh, we've had uh, some of their members come to our, to our uh, training and, and give us training on domestic abuse. I think that can be further enhanced. And uh, I agree that maybe the screening process needs to be looked at to be made more robust. We're happy to engage with the Scottish Women's Aid in, in that respect. But um, I, I just have a slight concern about closing the door fully on um, mediation as an option uh, in all domestic abuse cases. I wanted just before I bring Liam in, if we could get uh, an idea of the, um, the, the size of perspective on the size. Do women's aid have any statistical evidence regarding the percentage of civil family law cases that include evidence or allegations of domestic abuse? No. No, they don't. I can, we can, you know, there's, there's a lot of evidence about, um, so for instance, if you look at the child protection evidence and you can see many, many cases um, of child protection cases um, that, cross, that are intersecting with contact disputes um, uh, in which domestic abuse uh, isn't identified until post-criminal justice and civil justice um, uh, uh, proceedings. Um, and there's, there's lots of statistical and empirical evidence around that. But in terms of civil, you know, the, the body of civil law cases in Scotland, I'm not aware that that number is available, but I'm happy to look for it. That, that would be helpful. Yep. Liam McCarthy. Uh, thanks very much, Kavina. I, I think the questions I was going to pursue, you, you generally um, 
covered fairly well, so I'm just going to pick up a couple of points from, from what's already been said. In relation to the availability of, of legal aid, when we had the round table, there was a bit of an exchange um, with Colin Lancaster, who was giving evidence at that stage uh, around forthcoming meetings to discuss legal aid in the context of arbitration. Now, if those negotiations are ongoing and there hasn't been a, a resolution to them, then um, that's fine. But I, there seemed to be a recognition there that this was um, potentially an, an anomaly that needed to be uh, addressed. So if there's any uh, update, you can provide us on those discussions and, and um, any further discussions that may be planned with SLAB uh, around arbitration and legal aid. That would be helpful. I don't have any information to update you on. Flags has always tried to engage with SLAB historically and uh, with Mr Lancaster's predecessor on this issue. I know that the, the Faculty of Advocates and uh, some other bodies are engaging in the strategic review mm -hmm. and I understand that the strategic review has said that the availability of arbitration particularly in contact cases ought to be looked at as funding uh, through legal aid because it would be quicker, more efficient, more appropriate but it, it's my understanding that it will take primary legislation to allow arbitration to be funded by legal aid and until that happens, uh, there's not a lot we can do, but FLAGS is always uh, keen to have a dialogue so far as uh, SLAB or the Scottish Government want to have that with us. I, I should um, also declare an interest as um, uh, my wife is a trained uh, mediator with Relations, uh, Relationship Scotland, uh, Orkney. Um, I, I think in relation to the um, discussion around whether or not the domestic abuse cases in all circumstances should be um, kept away from, from mediation. I was interested in the point about the voice of children. I'm certainly aware of cases that have been brought to me where um, it, it would appear there, are, there is evidence that while domestic abuse possibly of a, of a control and coercive nature rather than violent uh, violence towards the, uh, t t towards the mother um, has taken place. Um, but actually the, 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 the voice of the children in those discussions appears for whatever reason to still have a, a loyalty and a desire to, to, to make contact with the father. How in those circumstances, possibly without some form of mediation, can contact arrangements be a, a, a arrived at that give, I suppose, a due weight to the to the uh, to the interests and the and, and the wishes of the of the child? I mean, I, I appreciate and uh, in, uh, hypothetically, it's it's difficult to, to answer that. But these situations do seem to arise reasonably routinely, and therefore, um, kind of trying to find a, a way of getting through that is is, is certainly something that I, I suspect you're all wrestling with. I think it's, um, it, there's a piece of research that was funded by the Children's Commission um, a couple of years ago looking at court reports um, uh, in, the, in the context of um, domestic abuse and contact and uh, heartily recommend that. And absolutely, um, we, you know, I think it's, we, our position is often mistakenly identified as being um, uh, uh, opposed to contact in all cases and that is not the case. Um, we are. We think part of the problem in the system is that um, the the decisions are being made without com without um, consultation and participation of children and young people, whether they want contact or don't want contact. Now that research shows that contact is often is ordered in, um, when children. Uh, about 80% of the time agrees with what children want when they want contact, and about 20% of the time when they don't want contact. So the system is very much skewed towards a certain outcome, I think, which is part of our concern. But the other issue for us is um, we have been working with the Children's Commission on trying to look at alternative models. So for instance, in West Lothian, um, they have a, a position of a specialist domestic abuse children's rights officer who um, does uh, reports for the sheriff, the local sheriffs, uh, comes from a children's rights perspective, spends time with children as young as four years old to talk to them about what they would like, and then makes an independent report to the court. Um, 
we think that there are a variety of ways of feeding children's voices in. And, and we know, because I was working there when we set that post up, you know, that the that sheriffs would say to the, to the children's rights officer, well, what do you think we should decide? And, and what she would say is, that's not my job. My job is to, is to communicate to you the, the views and experiences of the children. I, I mean, it, it's, that's helpful. I, the, um, didn't seem to me any reason why that input couldn't be factored into mediation or indeed uh, arbitration as well. I mean, obviously you've got a skilled individual who's trained in those in those specifics uh, and in, in articulating the, 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 the views um, of, of the child. Is there any reason why that couldn't be? Um... I, I think that we should be very creative and I don't see any reason why that couldn't work. I guess the, the point that I really want to underscore here is, and we have this in legislation, sadly not in practice, is that the safety of the children and of their mother needs to be paramount. And, and um, if in fact there, there is an assessment um, that the, the, the safety can't be guaranteed, then, then you know, that's the trump as far as we're concerned. And so often in these cases, given that we have libraries of evidence that say in the context of visitation and contact, children and women e experience re-victimization, that you have to be very robust in your assessment of whether it can be safe. And that is not the case in the way the system operates now. But I mean, it's, I, I'm right in saying that there are mediations that take place entirely um, with each individual not actually sitting in the, 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 the same room. Um, I mean, th that is not un uncommon. I, I would say it's, it, it does happen, but certainly in Relationship Scotland, that would be unusual, not right. unheard of, but unusual, because I think the point is if there is a course of relationship, then mediation yeah. isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. Mediation, the way we operate it, is a voluntary process. Both parties have to be prepared to engage in a discussion and be able to engage in that discussion mm -hmm. freely. So if there is a coercive control situation, then mediation isn't going to be appropriate and that decision will be made by the court. And then it's around whether the contact centre supervised or supported contact can take place. But that's a whole kind of other mm -hmm. argument. I, I kind of was thinking that uh, this was around mediation in civil disputes generally and with learning from family. And my experience in 15 years is that mediation has been around in family as an option since the mid-1980s, but the uptake of it is still pretty poor. So although I understand what Marsh is saying around uh, being wary of any um, requirement for people to go to an information meeting, unless something changes, there isn't, there's going to be this cultural shift towards a more collaborative, working together approach to resolving disputes. So I think there does need to be some change to make sure that people fully investigate all their options. So mediation is a big one, but there's also arbitration, uh, collaborative law. So I think there does need to be a more formal need for people to investigate all of those options, but still make an informed decision about what's appropriate, and the court might well be the appropriate option. So I'm not saying we shouldn't have the court. Absolutely, we need to have the court. But we also need to do something to make a step change shift towards people because it's been around as an option for families since the 80s there's a rule of court referral and in some areas some sheriffs will use that in other areas they don't some family lawyers are very good at explaining the options to clients others not not so good so i i, I suppose i would just bring it back to uh, there does need to be some form of requirement for people or, or some something that compels them to, to at least investigate all those options thoroughly. But if you're to, if you're to get legal aid for a court case, you, you need to have demonstrated that you've at least explored um, the option of, of mediation or some alternative. So that, those you know. rules changed in a couple of years ago? Yes, yeah, so you do. The Legal Aid Board have been more proactive in, in asking about any attempts to negotiate or, or resolve the, the matter and, and the question of mediation would be asked. But it, it's still not in our view, I think, enough, and, and in this, I think, CAM and Relationship Scotland share views as to what, what is required. Um, I, I noticed reading the, the minutes from the last uh, meeting, there, there were a couple of points particularly highlighted. One was information about mediation and other, and other forms of dispute resolution, and I think there is a, a great need to, to expand on that to make sure that everybody is well informed as to what their options are. 
At the moment, uh, as lawyers, we are obliged to talk about uh, alternative dis dispute resolution, um, but, but there's no, there, there's no uh, overview of that, so there's, there's no checking of that, and as Rosanna said, I think it's fairly patchy uh, as to the extent in which it's being discussed. But um, it, there has to be a bit of a sea change in attitude and approach, uh, and this really has to come from above. Unfortunately, we are offering these dispute resolution mechanisms in the context of an adversarial system. That is still the, the default uh, mechanism for resolving disputes in this country. Uh, and access to that adversarial system is, in my view, and I speak as a solicitor as well as a mediator, is still too easy. Um, there has to perhaps be some, and I hesitate to use the word compulsion because I appreciate that's a whole, whole uh, different discussion, but there maybe has to be some compulsion to at least make people stop and think and to explore other options before they jump into this adversarial process. We did put a proposal um, ourselves, Relationship Scotland and CAM, a joint proposal to the Legal Aid Board and um, Scottish Government to pilot um, information sessions for people, in, particularly in contact cases, in four court areas to um, trial out uh, a more kind of structured requirement to go to an information meeting to find out what all those options are. So that proposal is, I think, sitting uh, with the SLAB Policy Committee at the moment. You mentioned the Legal Aid Board and, and the steps they take, uh, and clearly that perhaps helps, but only in respect of people who are eligible for legal aid. It doesn't create any sort of a, a hurdle or a, or, or a cause for, for pause for those who are not uh, eligible for legal aid, they still have straight access into the courts, into the adversarial system. I think it's important, uh, I can't comment about the voice of a child in mediation, but I think it's important for me to again say in arbitration, when the arbitrator is making a decision about a child, the welfare of the child is the paramount consideration in making that decision. And before that decision can be made, the arbitrator must have explored whether the child has a wish to express a view, and if that child does have a wish to express a view, what that view is, and then to determine the weight that's attached to that view. And that's all dependent on the age and stage of the child and the circumstances in which the view is expressed. And the arbitrator has the ability to have a report or an expert child psychologist, an independent court reporter, obtain those views. So we have, as arbitrators, a whole range of ways of obtaining the voice of the child in the dispute. I think the same applies in mediation as well. Um, and Isabella has very, very properly outlined the, the fundamental concepts about how we deal with this, the rights of the child, the need to, in law, to, to, to hear the voice of the child. And, and certainly in mediation, we, we seek to do that as well. Whether it's uh, by discussion with the parents, who ultimately are probably best placed to know uh, what their, their, their child is going through, but uh, where, where appropriate, more, more directly by speaking to, to a child in mediation as well and, and gaining his or her views. So there's certainly an option to do that. I think we would probably all agree that there isn't one solution that's right for every family in every circumstance, but it's about people making an informed choice about what's the best option for their dispute is, I think, what we, we should be moving towards. I think it's quite interesting that Me Ireland have introduced a Mediation Act for all civil disputes. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is definitely a route that many jurisdictions are going down, and, and I think it's important that we explore that properly here. I think Rosanna is absolutely right. You ought to be able to make an informed choice about the best method for resolving your dispute, but your choice should not be trammelled by your economic wealth. Okay. Dr. Scott? Um, just to add, I, um, I welcome uh, the support for the voice of the child, but I think it's really important for us to understand um, how much change needs to happen in our system for that to actually be taken seriously. And I um, encourage the committee to take a look at the, the joint project that, that Scottish Women's Aid did with the Children's Commission um, in speaking to children and young people and finding out their experiences of intersections with court reporters. Uh, their, their stories were pretty um, compelling, and it was put together in a film that's available on the website. 
please do take a look at it. I think it expresses the, the difficulties of taking a system designed for adults and then pasting it on top of children and young people. Okay, thank you. Liam Kelly, supplementary. Just very briefly, thanks, convener. Um, the, the, we've heard a lot about the court perhaps might be appropriate uh, and an adversarial system. Uh, it's a slight tangent, but since we're generally looking at ways in which we might be able to improve on what we've got at the moment. Does anyone in the panel have a view on the one family, one judge idea, being this idea that you could have the same sheriff to hear uh, all criminal and civil matters? Uh, is that something at least worth trialling, Dr Scott? Um, considering that that was something that I hoped the committee would take up uh, quite some time ago when we were talking about the domestic abuse bill, I have to say I'm heartily in support of it. Um, uh, we know well, I've had some conversations with a retired Supreme Court judge in the U.S., um, in New York, um, who was part of instituting it there. And she's very enthusiastic about it. She said it's efficient. It's more efficient in terms of court time and resources. It certainly would help address the, the problem that we've discussed, which really under, underpins a lot of the, the civil law discussions we've been having here, which is the gap between criminal and civil um, uh, law in Scotland. Uh, and um, we've spoken with a number of sheriffs who, who also would, would consider it. I think the problem in the system perhaps might be having to restructure how the court schedules cases and some other issues. But we would heartily recommend a, 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 um, a very good look at doing that, putting that model in place. I think it's in the gift of sheriff principles at the moment, so. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to call Rona, and after that, Maurice Corey. Thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, we have touched on this, and I don't want to lab labor a point, but just to give us a perspective, um, can you tell us how often in practice a sheriff or judge does refer a case to mediation? And, and do you think that the court system is working well in that respect? Um, you know, or, or is it not, not doing it enough? Can you? The answer to that is it's, uh, it's, fairly, it's fairly patchy. I don't have particular numbers for, for referrals, but uh, you'll find certain sheriffs uh, are more favourable towards mediation, are perhaps ex-mediators themselves. And, and can see um, the, the benefits, whereas others perhaps uh, see fewer benefits and perhaps try to, uh, to some extent, mediate themselves in, in the context of child welfare hearings. Mm -hmm. um, I think sheriffs should certainly be encouraged to, to use the mediation um, option more, um, even within the context of, of a court case. Um, uh, to go back to the, the comment about the, the one, one family, one judge, I think I think certainly in the context of family law, having more specialist um, uh, sheriffs who deal specifically with family cases, uh, and I know they do that in, in, in the bigger courts, but uh, and there's obviously a resource issue in other courts, but that clearly has to be better. Somebody who is experienced in the family law, uh, who can more proactively manage a case and perhaps involve other forms of dispute resolution as part of that case would certainly be helpful. Um, I don't think the, up, the, the uptake on, on alternative dispute resolution within um, family cases that go to court is, is sufficient, in my view. And, and as a solicitor, um, do you see it as a solicitor's, solicitor's role to advise their, uh, the family or, or their, their clients that, that that's available to them? Most good family lawyers will uh, seek to find a resolution. Um, court very much is last option, okay. uh, and, and, and other, other options would be explored. Um, certainly. Not all family lawyers are good. Family lawyers, that's all I'd say. <laughs> Some of them are excellent, but not all of them are good. Yeah. Okay, thank Just you. Just on the, the one family, one judge plan, of course, that's what you get if you go to family law arbitration. You choose your arbitrator, who is an expert family lawyer, and they see your arbitration through from beginning to end, so you don't have a different sheriff or judge dealing with perhaps a different aspect of the case at different stages. Mm -hmm. Now in Glasgow, Aberdeen and Edinburgh, we have designated family sheriffs and we now have a, a judge and a half in the court of session. But that doesn't mean that they are able always to see a case through every aspect of its procedure, interim decisions, most of them try very hard, but they don't always achieve that. You get that in family law arbitration. So what 
I'm not sure, because I don't understand, is whether that links the criminal and the civil? Or Ar no, arbitration, family law arbitration is in civil only. There is no arbitration in crime. So that is an issue that uh, yes. Nikos alluded mm -hmm. to, which is that um, there is a disconnect between uh, criminal and civil. So a case can be considered in the civil court without any knowledge about previous or, or other criminal convictions. So, and that's an issue for our contact centres that we get cases referred to us um, and we have no information about other work. So unless they happen to disclose it to us then. So there is a disconnect. I think that's a whole other topic, but there, which I'm not an expert on, but there is a bit of a disconnect between the criminal and civil way in which cases are managed. So I'm not sure if that, I don't know enough about the one family, one judge, but if that was to resolve that, that would be ideal. Just thank you. <laughs> Okay. Boris Corrie. Thank you, Karina. Um, can I uh, ask uh, Mrs. Ennis and also Rosanne Kubert this particular question? Uh, what weight do you give the child contact centre as evidence uh, work with children in the ADR process, bearing in mind that they are not regulated, which concerns me greatly? What, what yeah. your question is, what weight do we give? Yeah, what weight do you give? Bearing in mind they're, non -re they're not regulated. Okay, so Relationship Scotland runs most of the child contact centres yeah. as well as uh, I'm more on mediation side. So child contact centres are a great place for people to, it's kind of like a bridge from if there's no contact to establishing a better system. Mm -hmm. um, many families who use our contact centres will also, as relationships improve, potentially access family mediation and then that's an opportunity for them to talk about the issues that they've got and try and find a way of moving that contact on so that they don't rely on the contact centre so they might then use it just for drop off and then ultimately have their own arrangements out with the contact centre. So contact centres play a really important role in helping establish and re-establish relationships with, for children with the parent that they don't live with. Um, I, I know of the concerns about regulation and we would support regulation. I think one of the issues is the funding that's been around historically for child contact centres, but they play a really important role as a stepping stone in many cases mm -hmm. to, for families mm -hmm. where one parent hasn't had a relationship with the child. Increasingly, we're seeing families that maybe never did live together and there's a child and then some years later, the parent who hasn't been living with the family, who's most often the dad, but not always. So it's about actually getting to know their child. This suddenly we're talking about, here's a, another adult who's your parent, but you've never met them before. So actually there needs to be a safe place for that relationship to develop for that parent to learn parenting skills. So I think we're, we're quite off topic, but, but, but contact centers play a really important role and mediation can support that process, particularly in relationships Scotland, because the, the two are very closely there are many centres are running both of those services, so the families can move between the two. Mm. Can I ask supplementary to this? One of the things that concerns me greatly is there is sometimes a, a, a forced situation where the, a child in a domestic abuse situation is forced to meet the abuser, okay, as part of the, the goodness of mediation within the contact centres. <coughs> there's something seriously wrong with that because that then can affect the child. Does that not concern both of you? Absolutely. Cases what are you doing about where it? there is domestic abuse, absolutely, children need to be safe yeah. and they need to not be exposed to further abuse. Yeah. I would agree with Marsha that the way in which these decisions are being made in the court process mm -hmm. needs significant review. We would argue that there needs to be a proper risk assessment done prior to a, an order for contact being made. Because what we do is we, we get cases coming to us, they've got a court order for contact, we do a risk assessment in terms of can we facilitate that contact to be safe, but whether in the bigger picture of that family it was appropriate or not, we're not the decision makers in that. So I do think there needs to be a much better risk assessment done where domestic abuse Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is a concern right. prior to them coming to the contact centres. We haven't heard, sorry, I mean, uh, Mrs. Ennis, what, you know, comment on my questions. Well, if a decision has been made about uh, contact that it should happen, then the arbitrator or the sheriff or the Lord Ordinary will have made that decision in a particular context. They don't make the decision in a vacuum, and so they would have heard 
uh, how that contact was proposed, whether that be in a contact centre, and if so, what the, the facilities in the contact centre were, how that was to be managed, whether it was to be supervised or unsupervised or monitored, and all of those would have been evidence that would be before the decision maker, before the decision was taken. So if the decision was taken, it had taken into account all of those issues and nonetheless considered that ultimately the welfare of the child was best protected and promoted by contact in that environment or, or an alternative environment. So the decision maker has heard about how the contact centre works and, and generally the decision maker, well a, a flags decision maker will have had professional interaction and experience with contact centres in any event. So you'd agree with me that the, that the non-regulation is a concern to you as well? Um, non-regulation in what respect? Well, I mean, it's basically the choice of the sheriff in whatever um, area he's in, um, as that, that sounds a good place to go. And this is evidence given to us from the petitions committee, which I was on, uh, and it really concerned us in this building. Well, it's not the choice of the sheriff or, or the, the flags arbitrator or the Lord Ordinary. It, they will have been presented with the evidence of a particular contact centre and the facilities available at that contact centre. And if it's in the decision maker's view that the welfare of the child is best promoted by that model that they have before them, then and that's the decision taken having regard to the welfare as a paramount consideration. They don't get you know, a buffet of options and, and they choose independently. Their choice is based on the evidence that's put before them by, by both parties, one of whom will often want unsupervised, open-ended contact and the other who will want supervised or monitored contact at a particular contact centre. So it's not a decision that's made in a vacuum, it's a decision that's made having evidence before the decision maker that is tested and explored. And with the flag's decision maker, they also bring to that their own insight and experience yeah. as family lawyers. So you have no concern? I don't know that I have no concern, I, I, but I think, I think that we... Uh, it's been expressed that okay. there can be incentives, but the checks and balances are there as far as possible. It doesn't mean there won't always be improvements. Okay, Kavina, thank you. Um, on, on, on that, um, I agree with everything that uh, Isabella and Rosanna said about, about the process. A decision is being made uh, with, with all appropriate evidence, hopefully having been presented and, and duly weighed. Contact centres play an extremely important role in, in contact with children and to, to, to some degree it also addresses the concerns where there has been some level of domestic abuse. It is a safe environment, it can be a way of reintroducing a parent to a child, so they, they are, they're absolutely crucial in, in contact cases um, where, where there hasn't been a particularly good relationship previously. I do share concerns about standards, uh, you use the word regulated, I think standards is, is, is perhaps better, mm -hmm. but there has to be an appreciation as well that these contact centres are, are pretty much charities mm -hmm. uh, and they rely on donations and they, li and they, they are usually grossly underfunded. Um, I, I, so if there's a concern about, about standards and contact centres then there's a funding issue there as well. They have to be better supported because they play an essential part in, in, in um, facilitating contact between uh, a child and a parent. We have kind of gone off topic on the, the area we are exploring. So can I ask if um, witnesses have a view on whether the English requirement to attend a mediation information assessment meeting before proceeding to court um, in a divorce case is a model which should be considered in Scottish cases? And I believe there's an exception there if there's been any um, question of evidence of domestic violence or risk of domestic violence. Um, <coughs> in broad terms, we would support an information meeting for people to explore all their options prior to deciding how they're going to take forward and resolve their dispute. So I, I'm aware that there have been uh, some issues with the introduction of MIAMS, Mediation Information and Assessment Meetings in England. I think 
it in England was impacted by the fact that they took away legal aid at the same time, so there was quite a confusing message out there. So I think it's difficult to work out what the impact of the introduction of MIAMS was mm -hmm. because it can't be looked at discreetly from all the big changes in the legal aid system down there. So I think there's things that we can learn from that and we can look and see what's worked and what hasn't worked. But I think in broad terms, ourselves and CALM would support some form of requirement to f attend an information meeting to find out and explore all the options. So not just, they've called it a MIAM, so that narrows it down to mediation, whereas we, would, we were keener to talk about family dispute resolution information meeting, which isn't a really easy acronym either, but <laughs> it's more about a family dispute resolution information meeting, find out what your options are and then, and absolutely domestic abuse or other, or you can just decide, I don't want, I want to go to court. That's still my, so we would retain that as one of the options. Okay. Dr. Scott? Yeah, um, we took a look at the, the um, arrangements around uh, uh, mediation information and assessment meetings in England and Wales, and, and um, the exemptions for domestic violence um, uh, are indeed there. Um, however, uh, uh, um, in order to access that exemption, uh, what has to be provided to the judge is evidence such as a police report um, that domestic violence has taken place. And it, that's a really big circle back to all the problems that, that, that we mentioned at the beginning, which is that the systems are not competent for assessing that. Any other questions? Yes, I, if I can come back into that, because I, I mentioned earlier the, the, this issue of an element of, of compulsion. Um, uh, CAM and Relationship Scotland uh, conducted a number of meetings uh, and engaged with Scottish Government representatives and uh, Legal Aid Board representatives um, and put together a proposal for a family dispute resolution uh, pilot, um, and that can be presented to the committee if, if deemed appropriate. Um, that's probably the level of compulsion we felt was appropriate. We're not saying that people have to be compelled to attend mediation or other forms of dispute resolution before they can enter the court system. Uh, the compulsion was that this would be a requirement, but not an absolute requirement. So there were certain safeguards uh, built in. Um, if somebody refused uh, the, the, the option of, of, of this meeting, they could give reasons uh, such as there has been domestic abuse. Um, there wouldn't be the same requirement as, as uh, uh, Marsha has mentioned about uh, producing evidence by way of, of a police report. Um, but I think our general feeling is that if we want to try and actually affect some significant change, people have to be given a bit of a push. Okay, thank you for that. Daniel. Yes, I, mean, I think my, my questions have been large answer, but I am interested in terms of the relationship between me mediation and the court. You know, so, so, uh, so courts can refer to, to mediation. I mean, what happens then? I mean, is, is, do they maintain any sort of oversight? Can, uh, you know, what requirement is there for mediators to consider whether or not they're actually appropriate to refer back to the court? Indeed, is there any sort of way that, that the court can then step in? I mean, just sort of, is it, do they, they go their own paths and, and, and never return, or, or, no, or no. is there some sort of oversight and, and communication that continues after that point? It depends at what stage a case is referred to mediation, and, and it does vary. Sometimes we have parties approaching us directly before they even consult solicitors, uh, before a court action has been raised. Other times we have cases referred to as after three or four years worth of litigation, uh, perhaps at the very last stage of the, of the process. When a sheriff refers to mediation, at the moment, um, a sheriff is only allowed to do so where there are issues of parental rights and responsibilities, contact or residence, not in relation to financial matters. So the case will be referred to a mediator through the auspices of the solicitors involved in the case. Um, as mediators, we will conduct the mediation process as far as we can, hopefully to a, a successful conclusion. If not, we would end the mediation process and refer back to solicitors. The one thing we do not do, however, because of the confidentiality issues, we do not produce any form of report as to what has happened, what has been said, who has acted properly, improperly within the mediation context. If we, if we deem it's, it, it has run its course and uh, a solution cannot be found, it's referred back to the solicitors and then the court process is picked up. Um, if, if a sheriff refers to mediation, very often they will assist or suspend the process mm -hmm. to allow mediation to take place. 
If it's successful, that, that hastens the early conclusion of the court process. If it's not successful, then the sheriff would pick up the process again with the solicitors. So just following on from that, I'm just wondering whether or not the, the, there's scope for improvement, and not just at the, the start of the, the, the process, but, but you know, at other points as well, to consider whether or not mediation might be appropriate. I mean, so you, 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 your points about the pilot are, are understood and well made, but you know, are there further points in the process that, 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 that mediation could be brought in and, and that could be improved? It's very difficult, I think, because most cases are very different. They're, they're quite unique, and, and this is where the sheriffs have a very, very important role. Um, a lot of contact cases, there will be uh, numerous child welfare hearings where the sheriff will have the parties and the solicitors in court in a more informal setting than a, a final hearing. Uh, and there are always options at that particular time for representations to be made or for the sheriff to consider a referral to mediation. It's quite difficult to impose a hard and fast rule mm -hmm. to say, uh, we're obviously suggesting that before the whole process starts, there should be some form of mediation information meeting. Uh, we think that's a good opportunity to, to, to invite people to stop and pause while appreciating that, that there'll be certain circumstances where a, a pause is not appropriate if there are some protective measures required or issues that have to be dealt with. To, to, to introduce a pause at a later stage, I'm not quite sure where that would take place perhaps before a final hearing is, is assigned, a final proof where witnesses have to attend, perhaps. But it's quite difficult to, to be hard and fast on that, given the differences with, with, each, with each individual case. I think by that point, a lot of views will be very entrenched no through views. a very adversarial process. So actually, the earlier people consider alternatives, the better, the more likely it is to be successful. Which yeah, could have been done by the time you get to, to that late stage yeah. of process. Okay. Fulton, supplementary, very briefly. Thanks, Kavita. I think it's a, it, it is a following up from Daniel Jones's point there. I, I, I'm, I'm keen to hear what you would, because we've talked a lot about domestic abuse and jail welfare conduct. I'm keen to hear what would actually happen as a specific example, if you like, if during the process of mediation, for example, you come across, a, you become aware for the first time of a domestic violence situation. What do you do? Is it just as you reported to? Daniel Johnson there that you know that it would be referred back to the solicitor and no report would be made or would in circumstances like that given the issue of domestic violence that we've talked about earlier would there be other mechanisms in place? When we undertake mediation through through CAM we send out uh, an introductory letter with a referral form and there are questions asked about uh, about issues of safety and whether there has been any any domestic abuse. I think when a case is referred to us it's more likely these, these issues perhaps have been aired already by, by advisors and um, thought the case still thought uh, appropriate for, for mediation. When we have an individual session with, with the clients and we speak to each separately uh, to begin with, these sessions can last an hour to an hour and a half and we do fairly thoroughly go through a background. And I think we have very experienced family lawyers and experienced uh, and obviously experienced uh, mediators you would pretty much get a sense of whether there is a significant issue here with, with domestic abuse um, and, and whether that would, would prevent... But, but what about during the actual process itself? And given the passing of the new law, and I do appreciate that the, 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 the new law is just uh, in place, but what about if actually you're witnessing you know, coercive control and behaviour during the process of uh, mediation? Uh, I would, I would stop the mediation straight away. Uh, I would stop it, and, and I frequently do, and I frequently separate the parties. And they, that, that's where you have to rely on the experience and judgment of the mediator, whether it's simply a case of somebody has got a bit hot-headed and perhaps a lot of the angst arising from the separation is spilling over, or whether there is a, a, a more serious underlying problem. And I have experienced both. And where I feel that it is a more serious issue, I will stop the mediation. I will separate the parties and say, sorry, this cannot continue, not in its present format at least, um, but uh, you, you, would, you would very quickly stop that. You, you cannot expose people to, to any form of coercive uh, control or verbal or other abuse in the context of mediation. We, also have, we have really clear policy and practice procedures, and if that arose in a joint session, we would stop the session. <coughs> And we would take responsibility for the mediation not continuing. So we wouldn't uh, make any, we wouldn't make a report about any party being more or less responsible. We would just say that the mediation's uh, not pro progressing and that the parties are going to resolve so, their dispute in a different way. So there, way. Wouldn't even, there wouldn't be a report submitted 
even in the event that no. a crime, because we are a crime not had been investigating dramatic, that situation. We are not um, investigating whether we we are just saying mediation can't go ahead. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> because we, because it's inappropriate. Mediation, both parties have to be able to negotiate, and if that's not possible, then mediation can't progress. So we wouldn't, we would just say that it's not possible. We wouldn't pass any view on that party's situation beyond the mediation room. Dr. Scott? I think I've probably said pretty much what, um, what we think uh, about mediation where domestic abuse might be involved, I think that um, we do have, uh, the, the, you know, again, it becomes this problem of this binary of mediation or no mediation, and I think women wind up in that position often because they have really limited choices, um, and they may not be able to just fall back on paying a solicitor um, uh, to, um, to protect their interests, and I think you know that that points at the larger problem that we have with women not being able to to reliably access legal support. But I I think that when we have to be really careful about not creating a system that further privileges a, a you know alternative dispute resolution so that women find themselves in those situations. Um, because if a, if a woman has made the decision that the safest thing for her to do is to, is to try and find some resolution to the contact issues because otherwise she'll be seen as disputatious or non-compliant, um, we've, really, we've really put her in a box and her children at great risk. And, and I can't, you know, there is no good solution to that except yes, absolutely agree with stopping the mediation, but it's really unfortunate when it gets to that point because she has vanishingly small options. Liam on that point? referred a couple of times to not further privileging uh, alternative dispute resolutions in the system. I think, as we've heard, there's a, a, a fairly patchy um, deployment of, of, of these options to date. So, in a sense, would you see more consistency in the way that the options that are currently available are, are being applied as further privileging, or, or is it is your concern more that there would be, as, as um, Mr. Scolarius was suggesting earlier, more of a, 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 a requirement on, on um, individuals to demonstrate that they had gone through a, a process of at least considering those options. Is it, I'm, I'm just interested in what you're, what you're describing when you talk about further privileging a ADR. I, I think the, the fact is that our, our system, we're all well aware of the problems which, with overcrowded courts and over litigious approaches to to resolving disputes and, um, uh, and that often then what happens is that um, women caught up in that system who are experiencing domestic abuse who may or may not have been well advised by a family lawyer um, uh, uh, are, are, are sometimes unintentionally but sometimes quite explicitly pushed in the direction of, of mediation because they don't have other alternatives. And I think what we need to do is to solve that pr the problem that they don't have other alternatives and instead of expecting mediation to solve that. Can I make an observation? Uh, and it's obviously in, in the context of, of uh, victims of domestic abuse. If you do not offer alternatives uh, as a way of resolving the particular issues that have to be resolved, the, 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 the default situation is a court case, which is uh, horrendous. Uh, to put people through that, if they think it's, if they think mediation might be bad, going through a court case where you have your your former partner, perhaps the the abuser, sitting next to you in court, being cross-examined by a solicitor who is acting for that person, that is not a pleasant experience. So that there have to be other options available, and and by all means, let's look at the models that are available. Uh, let's design models that are more robust to to. Um, perhaps address some of the points Marsha is making, but there have to be other alternatives uh, offered rather than the, the, the default adversarial court system. Can I just say there are worse outcomes than, than court? And I agree with your description of court, but w there, there is meant much evidence around re-victimization and, re and violence and coercion that happens in the context of um, uh, 
dispute resolution. So I, I think it's really important for us. I mean, you know, women and children get killed in the, in, in these situations, and I, I don't want to over dramatize. It's very very rare, you know, but I do think it's really important that we we remember that that's what we're talking about when we're talking about revictimizing. Putin, you wanted. To... Oh. Uh, sorry, was that... sorry. I, I, no, was, I, was I was going to say that I think it's important when we look at alternative dispute resolution that people have families in dispute know what all of the options are, that all of those options are available to them regardless of their income, and that they have good information to pursue the best options for their family. No one size will fit all. Mediation will not suit everyone. Arbitration or litigation or collaboration will not suit everyone. But what is vital is that all families in a dispute know that there is a range of options and one of them will be best for them or a combination will be best for them and they have access to choice. Okay. Uh, has your question been answered, uh, Fulton? No, uh, thanks, Commissioner. Just really to sum up the, the line of question I was doing, I think that the um, there is consensus uh, among the panel that, that many women will choose to use ADR, and I think the ADR is appropriate in many situations, and maybe for for women that have experienced um, domestic violence uh, as well. But I, and I do feel reassured with some of the things that you said about what, what's in place if you come across a domestic violence situation. But I suppose I would be more reassured if the, if each of the, the three panelists on on the right were to commit to. Um, increasing their training and awareness, given the new legislation, it's an ideal time in this area because it's, I suppose it's actually no different from women are experiencing domestic violence and men, but mainly women are experiencing domestic violence uh, regularly just now. There's, a new, there's new legislation passed. When we were doing the evidence session here, we were looking at what the police would do to learn and respond. We were looking at what social work would do, what courts would do, and I suppose your organisations are no different to that. So I wondered if you could give me that commitment. A, a training in domestic abuse and we had um, someone from Scottish Women's Aid come and look at the training that we provide for our mediators in that respect and they felt it was robust so we are keen to do more we run training every year for our practitioners around the whole area of domestic abuse and the emerging kind of thinking in that area so absolutely committed to and, and I acknowledge that you know well, we, we, there's more we can learn and there's absolutely more we can do, but we are really committed to doing that and we have worked with Scottish Women's Aid around our policy and practice procedures and our training for mediators, so we will continue to do that. FLAGS is absolutely committed to maintaining the training of its already trained arbitrators. We have local training pods uh, across Scotland and we have annual training events and in addition, the, all of our arbitrators, our solicitors, our advocates, who so are obliged to engage in their own uh, continued professional development and training annually. Uh, there's a set number of hours that must be undertaken in addition as part of our, our professional requirements. And FLAGS has, has its own training and its own training convener and undertakes local training too. I think from Cam's perspective, I would just pretty much echo what, what's been said. Uh, we also have uh, domestic abuse training for, uh, for our mediators. We've engaged with Scottish Women's Aid, as I've said previously, and this will be recurring training on an annual basis. And uh, we're looking at perhaps introducing an element of that in the, in the core training, the initial training as well. But we are certainly open to, to, to further cooperation and we do not take lightly the comments that the Marsha has made on behalf of Scottish Women's Aid um, I, and I think also to echo what uh, Rosanna said uh, we, uh, you can always learn more uh, you can always uh, learn more about processes you can constantly review processes you can take advice from those who are more expert in, in, in that particular field um, I, I, and that's essential but a commitment to training absolutely from Cam's perspective a lot of the cases where there's domestic abuse, the decision's being made by the sheriffs, and the sheriffs are basing their decisions quite often on a child welfare report. More than 90% of child welfare reports are written by family lawyers, and there's no requirement for them to have become experts in domestic abuse. So my concern is that for the domestic abuse cases is that the decisions that the sheriffs are making is being based on a report that's being written by someone. So I, I suppose the issue of child welfare reporter training is the one that I would like to have noted. 
I think there is a requirement, there is a need, a, a real need for better training in domestic abuse for the reports that the sheriffs are making their decisions on. Thank you. Ben. Th thank you, convener. Some of the points that I was going to raise have already been, been touched on. So thank you for all your evidence so far. I guess it, two, two main queries, if, if, if you let me. First of all, there was some discussion earlier around funding going forward in terms of, of, of legal aid for, for ADR providers and provision. Uh, however, there was, there was more discussion around greater regulation of the sector uh, and perhaps new regulation to uh, encourage uptake, uh, to create a cultural shift, a, a sea change. I think uh, the classical arts, you, you said that uh, this is required from above as we have an adversarial system at, at present in order to create a more collaborative uh, problem solving <coughs> approach. Uh, so, in essence, I would just be really interested if you could elaborate on any regulatory reform that you see as perhaps necessary. I know the potential of a mediation act was, was suggested earlier. Perhaps you'd like to elaborate on that. And secondly, uh, we've had a discussion around training, but I also want to consider training within the, the legal profession in, in general. Do we need to think more seriously around legal education and as well as CPD in the sector in order to encourage and facilitate any increased usage of, of ADR uh, so that we have the experienced uh, judgment of the, the mediator that's re or the arbitrator or, uh, that's required. Um, so an issue in legal training, but also and this is, comes from some case work, particularly I've received as a constituency MSP, but I think it's, it's also important considering EDR in the round. Do we need to consider whether we have enough psychologists and therapists trained in the area of uh, relationship counselling for families? Uh, I appreciate there are several questions wrapped up in that, <laughs> but uh, it, it, that's intentional in order to give you a chance to respond on these theoretical points as well as the practical. Who'd like to tackle it first? Dr. Scott? Or, no. Dr. Scott, and then I'll, I'll come. To um, I won't bang the same drum too much. Um, but I will say, uh, I think it's always, uh, I'm, I get quite nervous when I hear compulsion, and I, uh, I understand the, the sense in which that's being used in terms of trying to create um, a, a uh, you know, a more a system that's a bit more influential about decision making, but I, I think that any time you have any kind of regulation that's compulsory, um, uh, there there is a sanction involved for people who do not um, uh, comply, and imposing a, f a penalty on a failure to undertake mediation um, would really would really um, place women in an impossible position. I just need to underscore that. I think in terms of training, I, I just need to say that I absolutely um, uh, accept the really good intentions of the, this entire panel about training. Um, and uh, I think the, the problem is that the proof in the pudding at the moment is that whatever is being done is not obviously consistently delivering the outcomes that we would like. Uh, and so I think we need to scrutinize really carefully um, whether training is delivering competence uh, and where. And, and I think, um, you know, this won't be the first time that this committee has heard us talk about the need for training, not only for family lawyers, very much so, but also for judges and, and sheriffs. And, and I know that's not in your gift at the moment, but if we could can keep the conversation going in Scotland, that would be quite helpful. Um, and I suspect my colleagues to the left would support that. Uh, and finally, in terms of counseling, I think one of the one of the services that our that our groups often say they would like to be able to to provide um, is access to counseling, uh, both for children and and for um, adults. I think it's really critical, though, that we be careful about how we think about this. That that um, that co that counseling often implies, or the use of counseling implies, that there is a there is a person who's damaged and that that's the, the problem to fix rather than the abuse itself. And counseling and 
perpetrators is not an appropriate um, uh, response to perpetration. So while I think in general counseling probably needs to be more available to people who, who need it in Scotland, I would be very cautious about recommending it as a response um, uh, uh, in the context of domestic abuse. Okay, uh, Lisa? So I was going to say, in looking at whether we need a regulatory framework like a Mediation Act, I'm, I'm not sure the rush to regulation is the best first step. I think, as Mr. Scolaris said earlier, what we need to do is raise awareness, uh, make sure that the availability of ADR is known about, the range of options are known about, and that they're all funded. The training and education point uh, for lawyers the point of a law degree is to learn the law of Scotland, and that would include uh, well, I mean, the Arbitration Scotland Act is, is a piece of Scottish legislation. Uh, the diploma in legal practice is where those who have learned the law learn how to apply it in a practical way. So I think the ability to know how to advise and access for your client ADR would best be at the diploma stage. And at the recent FLAGS um, annual conference, uh, annual general meeting, we had representatives from Edinburgh University at that. And uh, FLAGS would welcome any input that any university wanted to its diploma course on uh, arbitration in a family law context. So far as the availability of psychologists and therapists is concerned, I don't know what the numbers are available. I think. Uh, the accessing of them, again, is a funding issue. I think if you have the funds to access that sort of expertise to assist the case, then you can find one. And if you are in a difficult position or you are legally aided, then the finding of an expert available to do it at legal aid rates is, is problematic. And so... I was going to just comment on um, those points. I think um, it's interesting around the regulatory framework and whether we need a mediation act. I suppose just as a, a punter looking in, I think that uh, we often bring about cultural change by having a change in legislation. So things like the smoking outdoors seatbelt legislation, until you have some intent clearly in legislation, you don't, or at least if you do have that, then you're more likely to bring about cultural change. So a mediation act would show an intent to mediation towards alternative dispute resolution. I think I've said what I needed to say about um, training, but for the legal profession, particularly around issues to do with domestic abuse and some of the more uh, children and the impact on children of domestic abuse, that's kind of the area I totally appreciate that they're well trained in the legal areas, but some of the more uh, children domestic abuse and perhaps could be improved. And uh, Relationship Scotland also um, provides uh, relationship counselling and some uh, children and young people's counselling and uh, some family therapists, but actually there are very few family therapists in Scotland trained to provide that. So I think um, that would be good if there were more available, but at the moment there just aren't. So even at the, uh, the SLAB, uh, Legal Aid Board have um, put in their new guidance that they will consider paying for family therapy and um, the challenge at the moment is that there aren't actually people in Scotland able to provide that service. Okay. And Mr Scolaris. Thank you. Um, the regulatory framework is, is a very big issue. I think uh, to, to affect the kind of significant change we're talking about you would need primary legislation. There's no question of that. What we have tried to look at is ways of encouraging uh, the greater uptake of uh, alternative dispute resolution through <coughs> this uh, pilot scheme that uh, CAM and Relationship Scotland had, had proposed. Um, long term, I think, uh, my position I think has been very clear. I'm a great fan of, of alternative ways of resolving disputes rather than the adversarial system we have. So certainly from my perspective, anything that moves towards that would be, would be uh, very positive. Um, training uh, in the legal profession, I agree with what Isabella said about uh, the appropriate time would be when students have completed their law degree and are uh, doing their diploma prior to entering into practice. Um, and, and, but that training has to be extended once they have qualified as well into CPD. 
uh, and the more training that is available, not just in ADR, but obviously uh, on the effects of, of uh, domestic abuse as well, and the impact that has is, is, is priceless, uh, it is very, very valuable. Um, I don't think I can really comment further on, on the issue about therapists or um, psychologists. Uh, I don't have any particular uh, specialist knowledge in that area. Just very quickly, you mentioned that primary legislation would be required for the sort of cultural shift that could be envisaged. Do you have any particular... I appreciate I'm putting you on the spot here, so if, if the answers aren't forthcoming at the moment, that's totally understandable, but do, if, do you have any idea what sort of primary legislation would encompass? Well, you really are looking at the court process and, and in some respects embedding uh, mediation, arbitration or, or any other form of dispute resolution uh, within that whole process. At the moment, the access is still straight to the courts. So you would have to look at, at court rules, you'd have to look at how, how the courts are structured. Um, it's a big, big issue, obviously. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, that concludes our questions. Thank you very much. That's been an excellent session. We will now uh, suspend briefly to allow the, the witnesses to leave. is consideration of a negative instrument. This is the Premises Licence Scotland Amendment Regulation 2018. I refer members to paper three, which is note by the clerk. If the committee wishes to report to the Parliament, it has to do so um, by 29th of March. Do members have any comments? Yes, Mark. <coughs> Knowing the pub industry quite well in this state, um, you, you, this, this has actually got a contradiction in paragraphs two and three, uh, because it goes on to say, well, first of all, paragraph two, it says the forms must, the application must be, uh, it have, provide a disabled access and facilities man, uh, statement in the form prescribed by Scottish ministers, that's fine. And, and then uh, paragraph three, it says, however, uh, the facilities disabled access and facility statement does not form part of the the application, so we need to just clarify that. Yes. Okay. Now it might be indicating that if there's an adjustment to the, um, the, 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 the disabled access, which I know many pubs, of course, they're very traditional, um, have had a lot of problems sorting out, then that may be a get out for the people not to worry about any alterations made. But I think it's something that should be clarified. Yep. Um, Daniel, had a comment. Daniel. Yes. Did you have a comment, sorry? Just a very brief one. Just saying that, I mean, I think this is this is very welcome. I mean, it's 10 years, uh, sorry, it's the best part of a decade since the Act actually passed. And this is something that the Bard campaign, Mark Cooper and Capability Scotland campaign long and hard for. And I just think it's just worth noting that this is a, a, a you know, they will be very pleased with the, that this will be coming into force at the end of the month. Although I do know uh, Maurice Corrie's comments. <clears throat> I support the fact that it's a good thing, yeah. but there uh, needs to be a check on that. We've got two options. Um, we can seek clarification and either bring this back or agree to make no recommendations but seek clarification nonetheless. So I'm entirely in your hands. I think it may be just a combination of the words. It'd just be clearer. Yeah. It, it's a, it, so it comes at first instance to somebody out there as a, yeah. as a contradiction. Yeah. I'm sure the intent is... is, is Yes, I think it's more drafting, is it? It's not so much policy. It needs to be redrafted. Uh, Gail, would you want to? Sorry, Liam. Liam? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I hear what um, both Daniel and Morris <coughs> have said, and, and certainly agree with the sentiment that um, we've, we've waited a long time. <coughs> I think on the basis that there doesn't appear to have been consultation, but only focused uh, discussion around this. 
Um, I, as long as we weren't going to delay the, the implementation, mm -hmm. I'd be more inclined to seek the clarification fairly okay. urgently okay. with a view to then passing once we have that, because mm -hmm. I think the, the worst thing would be that we, we nod it through, get the clarification that illustrates there's more of a problem um, uh, that Morris has identified. Than, uh, well, we have ample time to do this. If the committee so minded, we'll um, bring it back once we've got the clarification. Yeah, so, yeah that's fine. That's great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, that concludes the public part of today's uh, meeting. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday 13th of March, where our main business will be to take evidence on the use of remand in Scotland, and we now move into private session. And I suspend briefly to allow the public gallery to clear. <laughs>